the computer. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So, dear colleagues, we divided six papers which arrived to uh, our call for papers uh, and made uh, couples of um, reference uh, which thematically are close to each other. And our first section, as we imagined it, and also chronologically it was logical, uh, is dedicated to the phenomenon of the Croatian aristocracy. So we are waiting for Shandar Bena to join us and start with the uh, second paper from uh, um, this uh, little section, which is given by Ivana Horbets, um, Croatian Institute of History Zagreb, with her paper on Croatian Slavonian Bani, national heroes, Hungarian aristocrats, and king's servants. Uh, Ivana, please, I hope that technically we have provided all necessary conditions. Uh, thank you, Olga. Can I, can I uh, share my presentation? I have a small one. You should be able to do so. Mm -hmm. Try. Is it okay? Yes. That's great, thank you. So. Now, okay. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Olga and, and, and the organizers for uh, inviting me to this round table. Uh, I am proud to be a part of, of your project. Uh, the topic is very interesting, especially for the creation history. Uh, and uh, I'm very glad that we have a special small section here. Uh, in my paper, I will uh, try to place the very function of Croatian Slavonian bonds uh, in the context of changing political uh, processes in 17th and 18th century Habsburg monarchy. Um, at the very beginning of my paper, uh, I should mention that I will speak of bonds today as uh, viceroys. Uh, it is not the luckiest translation for the office, uh, mostly because uh, of the change in its character uh, during the second part of the 18th century, but I think it very much helps in the clarity of my presentation. And thank you, Olga and Jonathan, for helping me with this. Um, so in the uh, Habsburg monarchy, uh, 17th and 18th centuries were, were a period when the position of the Croatian Slavonian kingdom at the southeast borders of the monarchy was still of great significance for the defense of the monarchy against the Ottoman Empire. Uh, but it was also the period uh, of building a proto-modern state structures in Croatian Slavonia, uh, especially in the second part of the 18th century. Uh, this state-making uh, process has signif significantly changed the role of the viceroys uh, and upset traditional political and social structures. Um, uh, it should be mentioned here that Croatia Slavonia uh, was part of the Hungarian lands of the monarchy uh, or the lands of St. Stephen, uh, and uh, that is uh, that its administration was bound with Hungarian law although with a very high degree of autonomy in internal and military matters in this period. Uh, furthermore, Croatian Slavonian nobles were considered a part of Hungarian nobility and their estates were often located both in Hungary and Croatia Slavonia. Uh, I will address the function uh, of Viceroy uh, today from three different aspects. Uh, that are not completely separated uh, from the aspect of his service to the ruler, uh, from the aspect of the connection of that office with the Hungarian and also Austrian magnate families, uh, and from the aspect of the perception of Viceroy's role in uh, Croatian history. Uh, so, what was uh, Viceroy or, or Ban? Uh, considered to be in early modern administration of the monarchy. Uh, to put it shortly, uh, the viceroy was uh, an appointed governor or stadthalter, or local tenants uh, of king's power uh, in Croatia Slavonia with military, judiciary, and uh, civil or political uh, jurisdiction. Uh, he was a mediator uh, between the Croatian Slavonian estates uh, and the king, uh, and he took an oath uh, to both the king. Uh, and the estates. 
uh, in military matters, uh, he was the chief commander of troops. In civil matters, uh, he presided over the Barnes Court uh, and was responsible for organizing the administration until 1767, uh, when the first execu executive body in Croatia Slavonia was established. Uh, the model of uh, the Viceroy's service therefore corresponds uh, to the uh, usual model of transferring the ruler's rights and privileges to his uh, representative in local government, very common in the administrative practice uh, of medieval and early modern Europe. However, the character of this office very much changed during the 18th century uh, with the cessation of Ottoman wars with the reform, and with the reforms carried out in the military frontier. Uh, the Viceroy's military duties took a back seat uh, and the judicial and administrative reforms in Croatia Slavonia, his civil duties were more strictly subject uh, to the control uh, of court institutions. Uh, to uh, address uh, the topic uh, of this paper, I will start with the 17th century uh, and with the example of Viceroy uh, Peter Zrinski or Peter Zrini in Hungarian. Uh, Zrinski was a, a descendant of one of the most prestigious Croatian families uh, with significant political, economic and cultural influence on Croatian and Hungarian history, as well as uh, the history of the Habsburg monarchy. Uh, several of his ancestors, uh, as well as his father and his brother, uh, served as viceroys uh, and were remembered as skillful warriors uh, against the Ottomans. Uh, together with his brother-in-law, Frank Christoph Frankopan, Peter participated and was one of the organizers of the magnate conspiracy uh, against uh, Leopold I uh, in attempt to overthrow uh, Habsburgs. Uh, both of these Hungarian aristocrats were accused of uh, crimen lese maestatis and executed in 1671, uh, which soon led to the extinction of both families. Uh, in the historical remembers, uh, Peter Zaninsky and Frank Christoph Frankopan uh, were often treated as uh, heroes and martyrs who uh, laid down their lives for the interests of their homeland. Uh, their actions were often explained as an act of patriotism, and the role of Habsburg court in this process was treacherous towards the Croats who defended the border of the monarchy from the Ottomans. Uh, when reading the process files, uh, we could see that the Habsburg court uh, was very eager to made, make an example for such rebellious acts, uh, but also that uh, the cooperation uh, of Zrinski with the Ottomans, uh, who were actually primordial uh, enemies of the Habsburgs, uh, was later put in the background of the affair. Uh, although serious historiography has generally been more cautious uh, against mentioned assessments uh, and was more concentrated to the presentation of sources, uh, such patriotic uh, explanation of uh, Zrinsky's role in Croatian history was often welcomed by politicians and found their way, way into the construction of national mythology as well into the, uh, the school textbooks. Uh, to approach a more um, objective standpoint as a historian, I think we should bear in mind the family Zrinsky has also been powerful magnate family uh, in the Hungarian kingdom, as well as a part of uh, uh, the nobility in Habsburg monarchy and, and European nobility. Uh, Peter's mother uh, was uh, Magdalena Sechi, a member of notable Hungarian uh, aristocratic family. Uh, his political and economic goals were interwoven with those of Hungarian magnates. Uh, Peter's consciousness of his uh, creation origin was hereby not in conflict with his uh, Hungarian political sentiment. Uh, it is very much reflected in his personal letters and writings, um, in his family ties uh, and political connections to Francopans or, or, uh, or other significant Croatian magnate families at the time, uh, as well as in his choice to write in Croatian language and to improve the written form of the language. 
uh, it is true, however, that his death, uh, as well as the death of Frank Christoph Frankopan, uh, closed one chapter uh, of the Croatian history. Uh, after the death of all surviving members of family Zrinski, Zrinski and Frankopan, uh, at the end of the 17th century, uh, Croatian Slavonian kingdom was actually left without magnate families that could politically and economically be more independent from the court of Vienna. Uh, there is uh, no other or later mag magnate family of mostly Croatian origin that possessed so big estates in the country uh, or was so continuously interested in political affairs. Uh, and uh, that situation is very much reflected in the history of Viceroy's office in the 18th century uh, that I will address in the following part of my paper. Uh, well, this is a, this is a list of uh, all viceroys from 1671, uh, after the death of uh, Peter Zaninsky, uh, to the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, these viceroys uh, were very much influenced by the changes in international affairs of the monarchy during the 18th century, mostly with the cessation of Ottoman wars. Uh, and their office was also uh, influenced by the changes in internal organization of monarchy's local administrations. Um, so uh, what families uh, did Croatian Slavonian viceroys come from? Uh, as we can see, see from this list, uh, except from uh, Ivan Drashkovic in the 1730s, uh, all viceroys uh, of the 18th century came from uh, prominent magnate families that were more associated with Hungary than Croatia. Uh, Bacianis, uh, Palfis, Esterhazis, uh, and Nadashtis. Uh, mo most of these viceroys were economically more connected to the Hungarian states. Uh, all of them also had estates in Croatia Slavonia, otherwise they could uh, not have been appointed viceroys. Uh, some of them, as Erdudis, uh, had significant possessions in Croatia. Erdudis were even uh, hereditary supreme courts of the Varashtin county. Uh, furthermore, if we know that the viceroys were legally proposed by the Croatian Slavonian estates to the king until 1760s, and that the king usually chose between these candidates, uh, we could ask uh, what qualities viceroy uh, generally had to possess for the Croatian Slavonian estates and for the court uh, in Vienna. Uh, according to the sources, uh, for the ruler, uh, the a viceroy ought to be a renowned warrior, a commander of the troops, economically in, enough independent in order to support the troops in the name of the king, uh, and an aristocrat with estates and citizenship, or indigenat, uh, in Croatia Slavonia, so that he, he could legally uh, be eligible for the office. Uh, almost all of these viceroys, uh, with the exception of Ferenc uh, Esterhazy uh, and Ferenc Balasha in 1780s, uh, had a splendid military career uh, and fought in wars with the Ottomans, uh, as well as other wars that Habsburgs uh, led in Europe. Uh, Croatian Slavonian states had, in fact, uh, similar expectations from their viceroys. Uh, we can estimate uh, from their candidacies during the 18th century uh, that their priority was set on the military abilities of the viceroys. Uh, important criteria uh, were also the merits of the family for the court uh, and their connections with the court's uh, social and political circles. Uh, that is why uh, the estates uh, have, also proposed the vice, uh, have also proposed the viceroys from the Hungarian magnate families of uh, Palfi, Forgac, uh, Bocciani, Erdeti, or Nadashti. Uh, however, they often stressed that the knowledge of Croatian language is also important for a viceroy. Uh, that is why they have also proposed viceroys from the family of Patacic, Keglevic, or Drashkovic that were of uh, typically uh, Croatian speaking origin, uh, and uh, why they have often uh, emphasized the importance of, I quote, uh, their knowledge of Croatian language and customs uh, or their inclusion among compatriots. Uh, however, the most important thing to these states uh, was that the Viceroy was able to reside 
in the country and that he was influential enough uh, to mediate uh, political affairs between the Croatian Slovenian states and the court. Uh, when we put uh, all this together, uh, we can see that a very important aspect were also the family ties of the important viceroys. Uh, and that is why I have highlighted in red the feminine side of their families, because it is often overlooked. Here we can see uh, that uh, most of the mentioned viceroys, uh, mothers uh, uh, and wives were of Hungarian or Austrian origin. Uh, on the basis of which we can suppose that their mother tongue uh, was uh, Hungarian or German rather than Croatian. Uh, a very specific example of uh, that uh, were the viceroys of uh, uh, Kar or Karol Bacian uh, and Ferenc Nadasdi, uh, whose mothers originated from the Austrian families of Stratman or Stattenbach. Uh, so, Ferenc Nadezhdi uh, corresponded uh, with his brother Lipot, who was a Hungarian court chancellor at the time, uh, in German. It was actually their the mother tongue. Uh, most of the viceroys of the first half of the 18th century were praised in the historiography for their military successes, mostly against the Ottomans, but also for uh, victories uh, in other European wars or victories against Ferenc Rakotsi in Hungary. Uh, they were mostly pictured as uh, glorious leaders of, uh, of the nation. However, their civil role, uh, and they were also the highest king's officials in the, in the country, uh, was often overlooked or analyzed only marginally, uh, obviously uh, because there was no such glory in that role. Uh, the best examples uh, would again be uh, Karoj uh, Bočani and Ferenc Nadašti, uh, whose leadership role in Croatia Slavonia lasted for 40 years uh, in the 18th century and was marked uh, with dynamic reform activity of court institutions in local administration. Uh, three aspects of uh, Bočani and Nadašti's role uh, were singled out in the historiography. Uh, the first were the war victories. Uh, in that case, they were called mostly heroes. Uh, the second one uh, was their closeness uh, to Hungarian aristocracy. And in that case, uh, they were often called uh, Hungarian aristocracy. Uh, and lastly, uh, their administrative, administrative duties that resulted with numerous uh, reforms in Croatia, uh, Slavonia, uh, and in that case, they were sometimes called uh, alienated or based on the example of Croatian cultural historian Josip Matasovic, uh, I quote, politically castrated. Uh, in 1756, uh, when the demands of the ruler for reforms were more frequent, uh, Karoj Bočani, who uh, was uh, not residing in Croatia, but in Vienna, uh, had to resign from his duty as viceroy because he could not cope with the pressure. Uh, Ferenc uh, Nodaj, the uh, brother of the Hungarian court chancellor, was then appointed viceroy uh, with the task of implementing financial and, and uh, administrative reforms uh, uh, in Croatia. Although he was a, a military person and was very much eager to be more engaged uh, in the Seven Years' War at the time, uh, Maria Theresia wanted him to stay in Croatia. Uh, this shows uh, that from that time on, uh, the administrative duties of a viceroy became more important for the court uh, than his uh, military duties. Uh, that is also evident uh, in the election of viceroys in uh, 18. Uh, in the in, uh, 1780s, uh, two viceroys that were elected then did not have a military career uh, at all. Uh, that were Ferenc uh, Esterhazy, who was also Hungarian court chancellor at the time, and Ferenc Balasha, former Supreme, uh, Supreme Count of the Sriem County and, uh, and the counselor in the Hungarian Lieutenancy Council. Uh, based on the reforms uh, Nadezhdi implemented, the words of uh, a contemporary Baltazar Adam Kircherich were often quoted in the historiography uh, that the viceroy fell to the position and office of, uh, of a president or administrator. Uh, 
Balasha, on the other hand, uh, was often named only as commissary uh, because of his involvement in Josephine reforms. Uh, the election of uh, Janusz Szerdudy after the collapse of Josephine reforms in 1790 uh, was greeted as a return to the cons constitutional order, a return to the Holy Crown. Uh, uh, but his words, uh, regnum regnum non prescribit leges, uh, which, uh, with which he allegedly defended the use of Croatian uh, language on the occasion of Hungarian diet in uh, 1790 were often quoted as a proof of nations' uh, resistance towards the aspiration of Hungarians. Uh, however, uh, it is hereby mostly forgotten that uh, Natasti, uh, for example, uh, strongly resisted to the court's attempt to raise taxes in Croatia, uh, uh, Slavonia, and uh, that he was uh, very much successful in, in that. Uh, but uh, uh, that Erdi agreed to the loss of fiscal and uh, administrative independence of the country within the Hungarian kingdom, what resulted with many Hungarian Croatian disputes in the 19th century. So to sum up very shortly, uh, the perception uh, of the role of uh, viceroys in the public historical remembrance uh, and often in the historiography was uh, very much influenced not uh, so by the origin of an individual viceroy, but more by his ability to defend the borders and to resist to the political pressures within the monarchy. Uh, Croatian Slovenian states were eager to defend and restore uh, old borders prior to Ottoman wars, uh, but also they were eager to maintain a uh, status quo in internal affairs, which guaranteed them uh, their political influence. Uh, any viceroy who managed uh, to comply with these expectations was often regarded uh, a leader of the nation, no matter uh, of his origin. Uh, for the historiographic results, I think that this was the, 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 this was the result of uh, scattered sources written uh, on different languages uh, to gain insight into the viceroy's activity uh, or insight into any public matter of the time. One has to consult sources that are kept not only in Croatian state archives but also in Austrian Hungarian state archives, which was often not possible. Uh, this is why the research even today is often based on selected sources and contemporary publications that are often cited without the context. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Ivana. Uh, so I have stopped sharing. Questions, remarks, comments? Just raise a hand, a virtual hand, or switch on your microphone. Well, then maybe probably I would ask uh, to tell more if I understood properly. Uh, your research is a part of the bigger project, which is run by you and your colleagues on the um, viceroys and um, or, or, or national identities. Uh, could, could you just a bit uh, comment on how your research is uh, um, incorporated into, into some bigger project? Can I type something? Uh, microphone. Sorry. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, thank you. Uh, thank you all for this question. Uh, we do have a pro project that was uh, that is financed uh, by the Croatian uh, Science Foundation, and this is uh, about a uh, uh, Croatian. Uh, 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 the European origins of, uh, of modern Croatia. So it is more concentrated on the 19th century than, mm -hmm. than, than on the 18th century. And uh, this is actually a part of, uh, uh, a part of uh, research within this project that uh, aims to um, 
uh, to analyze uh, uh, to, to which extent did uh, uh, some propositions or um, uh, uh, or decrees issued by the Vienna court for, uh, for uh, local government in Croatia, Slavonia, uh, could be, uh, uh, to which extent they could be implemented or were they questioned or uh, uh, were they altered uh, after the discussion and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. I see Julia Boot from Yekaterinburg rose her hand and we asked her to switch on microphone. Julia, microphone. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you, Ivana, for your very fascinating talk. I liked it very much. Um, so yes, my question is, um, you were talking very interestingly about the duties of viceroys, about the qualities they had to had to be appointed to, to this uh, position by uh, Vienna. Uh, but um, what were uh, particular advantages, maybe privileges, real perspectives uh, uh, this position gave a uh, viceroy, uh, what were the uh, concrete advantages for a representative of an, aristoc uh, of an aristocratic family? And uh, was there any serious uh, political competition, maybe confrontation between the candidates to this uh, position? And um, did they get any real power and real uh, political power as soon as they uh, get this uh, force to serve the interests of their land, of their nation, um, if there was such a goal. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. This is a very important question. These are very important questions. Uh, so, um, uh, well, to, to be a ban or a viceroy at that time was uh, very much a privilege uh, within the Hungarian kingdom because uh, uh, it was um, um, uh, it, it, uh, it, the ban was one of the barons of the Hungarian kingdom that have uh, that had actually a prestige over uh, the. Uh, uh, the administration in Hungarian uh, Hungarian uh, 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 kingdom, uh, so it was a very prestigious uh, a prestigious office. Um, uh, during the 18th century, it was uh, it was uh, uh, good it was good paid. So. It had a salary that was very, uh, this was also very prestigious. Um, I don't know if there were any uh, competition. We do have uh, candidates from, uh, from Hungarian estates and they have always, uh, uh, they always uh, singled out uh, several candidates. Uh, and I believe these candidates were, uh, um, were contacted before that, so they they had to agree to be to be a candidate. So that would be some kind of a competition, but the, 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 this kind of competition did not result in any uh, in, uh, any any political or internal problems within the uh, within the country. Uh, so. Uh, uh, the position of the viceroy re really had uh, real power within the Croatia Slavonia. So he, uh, he was a chief commander of all troops uh, uh, in, in Croatia, which was uh, prestigious per se. Uh, uh, he was, uh, until uh, 1767, the uh, ban of the Viceroy uh, was, um, uh, was, uh, responsible for the whole administration. So uh, he uh, uh, he had appointed all officials within Croatia, uh, Slavonia, that were proposed by the by the Croatian uh, estates, uh, and he presided over the uh, over the Bans court. Uh, so he also had the, the judicial 
uh, uh, judicial prestige in the in the country. Did I manage to answer it? <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. We have another question from Darya Loshkin of Bashkir State University. Darya, please. Uh, hello. Uh, in your presentation, you said that it was important for a uh, viceroy to speak both Hungarian and Croatian. Uh, I wanted to ask you how did that correspond to language politics of that period? And were viceroys able to influence that in any way? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, well, that's... Uh, uh, the language policy uh, was uh, was important only uh, at the very end of the 18th century. Uh, that was a time where when Croatian languages were, uh, language was more uh, uh, more emphasized as a political language. Also, um, before that, uh, well, we could say in the 17th century, uh, the family of uh, Zinsky really did uh, speak Croatian uh, language, but with their uh, with his death and the, and the, the extinction of the family, um, uh, the other Croatian viceroys uh, during the 18th century, um, uh, we cannot be sure even if they knew. Uh, Croatian language. We, uh, I, I know exactly that uh, Ferenc Nadezhdi, uh, who was a uh, viceroy for, for 30 years, uh, from 1750s to 1780s, uh, he uh, obviously did not know uh, Croatian language because uh, some letters to him written in Croatian had to be translated to German or uh, or Latin. Uh, most of them used uh, Latin, which was a uh, uh, which was uh, an official language of the country at the time, as in, as in Hungary. Uh, and also uh, many of them in their private letters used, uh, used German language. Thank you. Uh, Theodora rose her hand, please. Yeah, uh, hi to everyone. Uh, nice to see you all uh, in this virtual space. Uh, so I have a question for Ivana and uh, so it's it's really you mentioned one very interesting point that I they really that I didn't know, uh, uh, and the fact that uh, actually the estates proposed the candidates. So it wasn't the candidates themselves, if I understood correctly, who were applying for for this highest position in the Croatian kingdoms. So uh, uh, you are very good in the archives. So so did you see those uh, proposals? Uh, on what basis were the ex estates choosing the candidates? What were the merits? Uh, you mentioned that in the first half of the century, so the, the, the military success was uh, one of the main criteria, but uh, I, I wonder if there were other, other uh, points, uh, politi also political important. Uh, um, were there some mentioning of the Hungaros identity? Because Hungaros is not uh, exactly the same as Hungarian, as we all know. Mm -hmm. So I, I wonder if you can comment on this. Thank you, Ivana. <laughs> Thank you very much. There are, uh, yes, uh, there are proposals from the, uh, from the East States until um, until the another states candidacy, uh, until the second part of the 18th century, uh, and uh, there um, uh, it was it was a proposal from the uh, from the Croatian Slavonian Parliament to the to the king every time when uh, one uh, when one viceroy died uh, that they had proposed another another king and, and, uh, and uh, the practice shows that uh, usually uh, the, the king. Uh, accepted one of their proposals. Uh, uh, after uh, after Ferenc Nadezhdi, and this, this was already in the 1780s, uh, the, uh, the parliament did not uh, uh, did not some. Then there, there was no parliament uh, anymore, uh, and uh, so so uh, there were no proposals for uh, for Estehazi or Balasha who were viceroys uh, in 1780s. Uh, but I'm not sure for 1790. I'm, I'm not sure. I should I should look that. Uh, I should look in the uh, in, in the uh, 
conclusions of the of the parliament. Um, uh, for them, uh, uh, in the whole period of the 18th century, not only in the uh, in the first half of the 18th century, uh, it was uh, it was uh, very important that uh, the viceroy uh, was a military person. Uh, that he had um, uh, social and political ties uh, in uh, Vienna, so it was not only, it was not so important as in nineteenth century that he was uh, from Croatian speaking origin. Uh, Hungarus is not mentioned there. I have never seen that. Um, uh, but it was, as I have said, uh, very important that uh, he could reside in the country and. Uh, uh, it was uh, preferable that he knows Croatian language, which I I, I think most of the bands maybe 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 added this uh, at the beginning of the uh, of the eighteenth century, but I think other other Croatian bands actually did, did not know Croatian language at all. More questions, probably. I would. Put a very, a very concrete question. You mentioned uh, answering Yulia that uh, the uh, office was paid. Mm, so, uh, from the history of diplomacy, I know that diplomats were also paid, but when they didn't invest their own money into the uh, into their functions so to, into the representation, uh, they couldn't afford the function of diplomat. Uh, was it implied that bonds also uh, invested uh, in as much many of them were uh, wealthy aristocrats that they invest their own, own money into function and representation? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, well, uh, in the military affairs, yes, they had to invest their own money. Uh, uh -huh. But uh, uh, in the other, uh, the second part of the 18th century, when there was actually no wars, they would be engaged uh, in. Uh, uh, they uh, should only uh, finance their chancelleries. So there, there was a chancellery of the viceroy. We do not know know much uh, much of this chancellery but I know that it, it exists so there were some some kind of uh, uh, secretaries and uh, writers and registrators and they, they, they had to pay them from from uh, their uh, uh, they had they had to pay them well from from their assets I see thank you. Um, we can uh, return to these uh, creation problematics later, but now I think it's time to um, open the floor to our second creation speaker, if I may say so, speaker of the uh, creation section. Uh, it is Shandar Bene, uh, who represents uh, both the Institute of Liter Literature of the Center for the Humanities uh, in Budapest and uh, Zagreb University in Zagreb. So, uh, his paper is entitled Family Resemblance, the Zrini Brothers, Formation of the Parallel National Identities in the Middle of the 17th Century. Uh, please, Shandor. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, and uh, first of all, uh, I would like to apologize because of uh, arriving so late, and I'm very, very grateful uh, so to Olga and to Ivana uh that uh, uh that uh, that she uh that they resolve this problem so and in advance uh in advance i have to beg your pardon because meanwhile maybe uh will arrive uh, my wife the dog will bark and so on and so on so uh, i apologize for everything in advance <laughs> so uh first of all uh i try to uh share my screen a moment, please. Um, oy, oy, oy. Uh -huh. I, yes. Uh, can you see it? Okay. So, um, yes, I hope. So, dear colleagues, uh, Miklo Zrini. 
uh, and Peter Zrini. Uh, I uh, use the Hungarian forms, but uh, you know, I, every time, uh, every time I would have to use also the Croatian forms. So uh, <clears throat> once for all, uh, that uh, uh, I will, uh, I will anyway uh, use the Hungarian form uh, now. Uh, so, uh, as you heard, they succeeded each other uh, as bands, sort of viceroys of Croatia, one of the highest ranks uh, of honor in the Kingdom of Hungary. As bands of Croatia, uh, they followed in the footsteps of their ancestors. Beside cultivating a tradition of Croatian origin, the family was also characterized by an unbroken political loyalty to the Hungarian crown. Miklos Zrinyi uh, the fourth, uh, uh, also ban of Croatia and commander in chief uh, of the Cisdanubian military district of Hungary, defended the fortress of Sigetvar against the besieging armies of Sultan Suleiman for a whole month uh, in 1566. The strong, uh, you, see, you can see now the uh, a historical painting from the 19th century and Austria, from an Austrian master, uh, master um, and uh, and uh, uh, Miklos or Nikolas Rinsky Shubic. Uh, so uh, to sum up, uh, the strong Hungarian-Croatian bond uh, continued uh, in the Zrinyi generations to follow. The House of Zrinyi was an ideal typical example from a linguistic, cultural, and political view of the complex, multiple identities of the of early modern times. The 17th century statesmen uh, and erudite Zrinyi brothers were representatives of a peculiar chapter in the history of European Baroque literature too. Both wrote a heroic epic on the siege of Sigetvar. Miklos in Hungarian and Peter in Croatian. These two epics were published in print a few years apart, along with lyrics of love and devotional topics in their volumes of poetry, The Syrian of the Adriatic Sea, uh, in Vienna 1651, <clears throat> and the Croatian version in Venice uh, 1660, respectively. As a statesman, Miklos followed closely in the footsteps uh, of his predecessors. Though he was extremely dissatisfied with uh, Habsburg politics by the end of his life, his feelings did not manifest in open conflict. He died in a hunting accident uh, in November uh, 1664. His brother Peter, on the other hand, conspired with the Lords of Hungary, the Palatine and the Supreme Judge uh, of the country against uh, the Vienna regime. Uh, and as a result, was imprisoned uh, in 1670 and beheaded for high treason, uh, uh, high treason in uh, 1671. Now, this is, uh, to put it broadly, the reality of it. The reality that was then distorted or allegedly distorted by the ugly 19th century nationalist spirit, setting in action a mutual damnatio memoriae from Hungarian and Croatian side as well, abolishing the connections between the different languages and literary traditions, together with the system of multilateral loyalties and identities. Miklos became a pillar of the Hungarian and Peter a pillar of the Croatian national canon. Here I'm going to make a quick run of some examples. Hungarian literature was renewed and uh, modernized at the beginning of the 19th century, and the figure of Miklos Rini had a decisive role in this transformation as a forerunner and a leading, leading example. But Hungarian poets, literates, and literary historians simply ignored the Croatian version of the Sirena volume, of the Hungarian Sirena volume. And in the political canon, Zrinyi's figure clearly appears as the instigator of the Hungarian national anti-Habsburg independence movement. And his anti-Habsburg policy became almost more important than his struggles against the Turks, his title of Croatian ban, or his military career in the Habsburg administration. This trend continued uh, in the 
also in the 20th century, even under the socialist regime. As an example, the Hungarian Military Academy bore the name of Miklo Zrinyi for a long time. In Croatia, the National Zrinyi Court uh, gained strength in the second half of the 19th century. I'm speaking about the, uh, about the cult of the, of the poet, uh, uh, Peter Zrinyi. Uh, so uh, in, uh, in 1868, the first major modern work on Northern Croatian non-Dalmatian literary history by historian and poet Ivan Kukujevic Saktinski presented Mikro Zrini as a traitor to his Slavic ancestry, whereas Peter was glorified as an ill-fated patriot, a martyr of the nation. This was soon followed by a major novel about Peter Zrini's Croatian national spirit and his struggle for independence during the anti habsburg conspiracy uh, from Ergen Kumici, Zrinsko Franko Panska Urota. Uh, Later, uh, the participants of the Zrini Frangepan plot, uh, Zrinsko, Zrinsko Franco Panska Urota uh, in Croatian, were seen as heroes of Croatian national independence uh, up until the, the 1990s. The repatriation of the relics from Wiener Neustadt uh, in uh, 1921 and their ceremonial burial and mourning at the Zagreb Cathedral cathedral uh, in 1971, clearly demonstrated the strengthening of this nationalist uh, movement. <clears throat> so if historical scholarship had anything to do with uncovering the truth, we would be on easy grounds now. After all, both national cards have biased and misrepresented the real intentions of the Zrinis. Their forts could and had to be corrected. After all, if I'm not mistaken, uh, that is why we came together here and now. Uh, quoting from the program, in the age of nationalism, prominent figures of mixed origin with multiple identities were acquired or privatized by emerging national movements and incorporated into national pantheons, which often competed with uh, one another for the same figures. But can such a rational examination of the past be continued with full confidence in rationality? My impression is that uh, plural identities are never a static thing in the life of the individual, nor in the life of the community. And the elements of difference and sometimes conflicting identity discourses can only temporarily be arranged side by side peacefully uh, as occasional ut utopias at the most. In the present case, this occasionality is answered by the commonly accepted legal fiction that all members uh, of Croatian nobility could see themselves as members of Hungarian nobility, Nazio Hungarica, as well. In other words, according to the leg legal narrative, they belonged under the Holy Crown of Hungary. However, in my opinion, it was not in the Romantic period that this idyllic picture began to transform. The first cracks appeared already at the turn of the 16th and 17th centuries, then continued at the time of the childhood of the Zrini brothers, of our Zrini brothers, in the jurisdiction conflicts of ecclesiastical institutions, in the internal strife of university nations, and in many other areas, including the de debates uh, in sessions of the Diets of Hungary, the characteristics of a new type of national feeling appear, reorganizing elements of birth, linguistic, cultural, and political identities into new configurations. Miklos and Peter Zrinyi were both raised in a Hungarian milieu. Their mother was Hungarian, and their closer relatives in the Croatian aristocratic families, the Drashkovic, uh, for instance, spoke and corresponded, uh, corresponded uh, more and more in Hungarian also between themselves. This tendency of majorization seemed the deadly embrace for the Croatian intellectual and political elite. There were many indicators that pointed out to this fear, but not getting into examples now, I just point out the most basic aspects of the issue. The mere fact, 
that these two brothers, members of the Croatian aristocracy, consciously split language use between themselves, clearly shows that they were in fact aware of the problem and sought to find a solution in their own way. The more traditional answer to the problem was given by Miklos, who wished to continue Hungarian-Croatian cooperation within the framework of the Hungarian state. In fact, he symbolically recaptured the site of the historical past Sigetvar with his heroic epic being written in Hungarian. Since the first literary adaptation of the event, an epic poem by Berne Karnarutic, uh, 1584, was written in Croatian, and Hungarian characters did not play major roles in it. However, Zrini's symbolic gest gesture was not towards Hungarians in the narrower ethnic cultural sense. His dream was not that of a unilingual country. His political vision had two pillars to it. On the one, on one hand, uh, it was about the reform of the Hungarian state, the modernization of St. Stephen's kingdom. And on the other hand, his aim was the liberation uh, of the Balkans from Ottoman influence. This letter would have paved the way for the integration of Croatian, Serbian, and Bosnian territories. For this goal, Zrini was not against cooperating with the Habsburg, but he firmly rejected the support of other great ex external powers, such as, uh, such as French or the Russians. In his later prose work, A Remedy for Turkish Opium uh, from 1661, uh, of the French, he writes, uh, I'm quoting, the French, if victorious, is unbearable, if defeated, is wicked. And of the Russians, I also quoting, I do not count Moscow, their country is far away, their policy is foolish, their regime is tyrannical, who would then need their help? The final scene of the peril of Siget also points in the same political direction when Miklos Rini, charging out of the besieged uh, fortress, kills Sultan Suleiman with his own hands. The recent res uh, research has clearly demonstrated that th this is not a case of classic fiction, but that of close historical analogy. The scene records the first battle of Kosovo, Kosovo Poye from uh, 1389, the great tragedy uh, the great tragedy of the Balkans, where the Serbian army suffered a uh, fatal defeat to the conquering Turks. But at the end of the battle, the fallen martyrs had an apotheosis and Sultan Murad I was killed by Serbian hero Miloš Obilic. By recalling this memory, uh, Zrini's, epic connects, uh, Zrini's epic connects South Slavic historical memory with recent Hungarian history, sim symbolically joining the past of the South Slavic territories and of the Kingdom of Hungary, thus also uniting their political futures. Perhaps it is worth briefly noting that this uh, same endeavor appears in a work uh, of family history commissioned by Miklos Zrini in the early 60s. The work was written by Marcus Forstal an Augustinian monk of Irish descent, the court priest to the ban of Croatia. The Stematographia Mavocie Familie Pomitu Mazrin, description of the coat of arms of the martial family of Count Zrini, is a typical Baroque literary genealogy. What makes, it, uh, what makes it particularly interesting is that it tries to disprove the Shubic ancestry of the house of Zrini, already embedded in the family memory, and tries to link the history of the dynasty to another current of South Slavic historical tradition, that of the Northern Scandinavian, in this case, Eastern Gothic origin. This was supported by an earlier uh, medieval title of the Zrinis, Counts of Ostrovica. Fostal made up a fictional Gothic ruler as the ancestor of the family, a certain Ostrovius, whose brother, King Totila, was in fact an existing historical figure. Totila conquered Italy for a short time, uh, for a short time in the sixth century, 
waging war against the Byzantine Empire uh, and finished, finished his life with a heroic death on the battlefield of Tagine. But why was Rini so interested in this figure? Because Totila did indeed resemble the Han King, Attila, not only in the name, but also in his political career, in his entire character. The figure of Attila played an extremely important role in the Hungarian national memory. He was a sort of a common political ancestor, the founder of the so-called Magyar Imperium. And Zrini thus virtually connected the Croatian family past with the Hungarian state identity. As such, we can say that the 19th century Hungarian uh, expropriation, the national privatization of Zrini history and of the literary and political heritage of Miklo Zrini was only partially unjustified. Though the national romanticism forgot about the South Slavic thread, the emphasis on Hungarian identity was already present in Zrini's original political and literary program. But how does Croatian historical memory relate to all this? Initially, Peter Zrini had the same program of his brother had, uh, the same program his brother had. In fact, uh, we can talk about a joint program. Shortly after the publishing of the Hungarian language Sirena by Miklos in Vienna, Peter Zrini began to translate the epic, formally keeping the matrix of the Hungarian original. Somewhere in the, in the 50s, however, something changed. Having translated eight cantos already, Zrini, Peter Zrini discarded the translation and started over the work, now along completely different poetic principles. He brought the Croatian language version of the epic closer to the traditions of South Slavic folklore at several major points. The emphatic references to the Hungarian def def defenders of Sigetvar disappear from the new Croatian version and the geographical, geographical and personal names are replaced by their Croatian counterparts. For example, the mountain Kesmar becomes Velebit. A hundred lads in the original become a hundred Croatians, and so on, so on. The metric of the new translation, dodecasyllable with double rhyming in the middle and at the end, also differed significantly from the simpler Hungarian pattern and was adapted to the metric used by Marko Marulic, the classic poet of the Dalmatian coast. We can only guess as to the reasons for such a change in the ideological, ideological and poetic directions. However, it was also at this time that a circle of literates and lexicographers began to operate in Peter Zrini's court in Ozai, seeking to unify Croatian dialects and create a new literary language. The new version of the Peril of Siget, the Croatian version published uh, in the Croatian Sirena volume in Venice, points to the south, towards the Balkans, both from a linguistic and a poetic perspective. And along an early Illyrian ideology, ideology it relocates Sigetva to the south rather than Kosovo Poya to the north. Of course, uh, this period also had its uh, own scholarly background, background and support. After the death of his brother, Peter Zrini retained the monk Marcus Forster in his service as a tutor to his son. He also commissioned Forster to compile a new version of the family history, discarding the Gothic origins and returning to the Illyrian, the South Slavic Shubic line. The work, combined this origin, uh, origin story very ingeniously with some Roman origins as, the, as was the fashion in the Baroque period. According to this new version, the Shubic were in fact a family of mixed origin. The conquering Croatian dynasty merged with the medieval remnants of the Roman Sulpicius family uh, on the Dalmatian coast and took their name. Over time, the Sulpicius name changed to Subitius in common usage. Brother Forster diligently collected new evidence. And interestingly, 
Zrini's new uh, ideas went along the program of some excellent intellectuals of Croatian birth, such as Ivan Lucic and Stepan Gradic, living in Rome at the time. As a result, the Illyricum Hodiernum map, published in the Netherlands uh, in 1668, dedicated to Peter Zrini as Ban of Croatia, shows the status quo after a prospective war of liberation in the Balkans. The highlighted area marks a political entity that, in addition to Dalmatia and much of Bosnia, includes Serbia, Istria, and uh, the northern Croatian territories, including the Zrini estates, the Mejimoya region. This dream would come true only centuries later, after the First World War, and would remain so until the early uh, 1990s. Um, the historical events mentioned earlier confirmed this turnaround in his thinking. In his conspiring against Vienna, Peter Zrini ran two political programs in parallel. In addition to, or instead of it, or instead of allying with the Hungarians, he began to envisage a poorly South Slavic solution, the forming of a modernized Illyria. It is thus once again proven that the Illyrian movement of the 19th century did have some grounds and rights to use Rini's literary work and his martyrdom as antecedent to his pre-Yugoslav aspirations. Perhaps the Illyrian founding fathers misinterpreted or overinterpreted the historical evidence, but if so, there had to be something that could be misunderstood. And there are other evidence waiting for innovative overinterpretation. For example, among the files, which Brother Forster never published, but prepared for any eventuality, drew up for his own use in some beautiful stemmas, proving that his employers, the Zrini brothers, Miklos and Peter, were in fact, on the maternal line, directly related to Bayezid, the son of Sultan Murad on one hand, and uh, Vuk Brankovic, son-in-law of the Serbian King Lazar, on the other. The Zrini, who defended Sigetvar and Suleiman, who besieged it, were relatives, a surprising fact that may come in handy sometime, uh, not even mentioning the possible Serbian ancestry. In conclusion, uh, I do not believe that history can do justice to the past as simply as we would like it, as I would like it. The past is not a static image uh, that could be prepared and studies under a microscope. All of its parts were and are still in motion. And when we choose from among the options, in this case, the various identity discourses offered by the past, we do not do this based on purely scientific criteria. Just as the real characters uh, in this story adapted their facts of past, that is their own family past, to their visions of the future. Such visions of the, of the future are uh, uh, always rooted in the illusions of the present. The very fact that we wish to see multiple identities coexisting peacefully in the past is based on our illusions of the present. What is frustrating therein uh, is not that such desires would not be legitimate or that there never existed situations in the past where these illusions were a reality, but how fragile they are. Still, they are worth, uh, they are worth playing with. Illyria can be seen as a symbol. Whether, it's, whether it is Hungary or not, it is an illusion of the past that gives us hope, without which we could, uh, without which we could uh, uh, not hope, uh, not believe in anything and could only watch the sad reality of ruined cities on the screen. The opposite is also true. If we wish to see another reality on the screen in the future, we need to strongly believe in our fragile illusions. As Oscar Wilde uh, so aptly put it, speaking about an early modern dreamer of some reputation, that there is no illusion, there is no Illyria. So thank you for your attention. 
thank you very much, Shandor. Uh, I am expecting questions or remarks, raised hands, or just uh, just questions. Then maybe I ask uh, to what an extent of the Zrini brothers and the very constellation of uh, the uh, identities, activities and artistic talents, a unique uh, case in Hungarian history. Are there any maybe parallel stories which could be compared with, with them or are they absolutely unique in all their um, uh, qualities? Yes, uh, uh, it's a bit, but uh, as I see, uh, it's uh, it is it is a completely unique example. So this uh, this case, uh, this splitting of languages, dividing uh, dividing of areas uh, of acting and so on, it is a, it is so unique example uh, that uh, that uh, we could see as well uh, in which uh, in which manner and to what extent uh, the later centuries uh, misunderstood it so mm -hmm. uh, if misunderstood or not anyway uh, the hungarians uh, uh, simply uh, simply cut off the croatian part uh, without which uh, the program the original program of Mikko Zrini, it was not only a, a, a literary program it was also a political program uh, program he was thinking about uh, thinking about uh, a real refund, uh, refundation of the hungarian kingdom uh, in on the base of equal rights uh, between the the member associa for example the creation of the hungarian kingdom we had also other evidence uh, in this direction so uh, cutting out this uh, this croatian part uh, Mikrozrini can seem can seem to us uh, as one of the national heroes or one of the of the proto national heroes of the of a, of a certain uh, of a sort of proto nationalism, and I think uh, the same case uh, uh, the same case uh, is the Croatian case, uh, but uh, but uh, here uh, here because of uh, because of uh, the, because of literary historian reasons, uh, Peter Zrinsky, uh, Peter Zrinsky or Peter Zrini never had uh, so significant uh, uh, role uh, as Miklos in the Hungarian literary history. So Miklos is, is really the matrix, the matrix uh, and the origo of, of, of the renewal of, uh, of our uh, literary modernization uh, at the turn of the 18th, 19th century. While uh, while Peter is Peter was a, was a very interesting example, but anyway, uh, not to the extent and not to the greatness of of of, of the re, of the real great uh, Croatian uh, uh, poets uh, of the time. So, I think uh, I think just this uniquity of the case uh, uh, is uh, makes it interesting to 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 research this their case so that's it other other otherwise uh, otherwise i could uh, that's okay i don't want to continue because i don't want to, to make another discourse so. um, more questions probably from literary historians or historians because uh, your paper is just what uh, all our activities are aimed at to uh, bring historians and literary historians together and uh, to have a dialogue which, uh, uh, well, in our institute, it may be our routine agenda because we are an institute where uh, historians, literary historians and linguists work together and still we need um, tighter cooperation. And each time we have a presentation which makes us all uh, think on our and reflect on our own topics. Uh, it's a, a great pleasure and inspiration for us. So thank you. 
Thank you also. Well, if we do not have questions now, maybe we will have some time uh, at the end of the round table for uh, closing uh, remarks and discussion, but now, uh, we finish with the creation section and uh, I have uh, my pleasure to uh, pass to the function of moderator to um, my colleague from the Institute of Slavic Studies, uh, to Lydia Pachomova. Lydia, you are welcome to organize our work uh, further on. That's and good before you start, maybe we'll ask Andrea, uh, how should we uh, manage your would you speak or would you would we just uh, look through your presentation so how should we how should we work the second no i can speak <laughs> okay then lydia you're welcome okay okay I can good. speak yeah, okay say it sorry okay good afternoon dear colleagues uh, it is a privilege to moderate uh, the one on the section of this discussion and I am more than happy to announce the first presentation. It will be done by Dr. Andrea Seidler and the title of her work, The German Community of Multi-Ethnic Presswork in the Second Half of the 18th Century. Please, uh, Dr. Seidler, and our screen are yours please okay. thanks a lot for for inviting me i'm i'm very sorry i'm <laughs> i am uh, currently at home in my little house in hungary having covid and and um um quite um, sick still um so as a result of this um uh, circumstances i would uh, ask to apologize for keeping my my uh, talk rather short and uh, and i think i will add a lot of of uh, information if we can can uh, um, hand it in in a written in a written form but i'm of course very uh, ready to to answer any questions that you you might have in in um uh, after after i i finished um, first of all, uh, let me say a few words about the topic itself. So, um, for most of my academic life, I have been um, investigating the German um, society, the German speaking world in Hungary. And um, uh, in as much as I was uh, very much focusing on uh, on a certain person in Hungarian history, on Karl Gottlieb Windisch, uh, about whom I will say a few words later on, but just to to uh, start with uh, him as in uh, with a few introductory words. In my opinion, and as far as my um, my investigations in this re respect are concerned, I would say he was one of the turning points of um, uh, the German speaking society and also of the of uh, I would say the 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 cultural um, the cultural efforts uh, of the the German speaking society not only in in uh, Bratislava Pressburg Pozsony but I would say he was the person who connected the whole uh, German speaking intellectual world of late 18th century Hungary um, through his his. Uh, his uh, media and his um, his intellectual work, his work as a scholar, and I will name a, I will mention a few of these um, the people today, and also a few of his efforts to to um, establish the German not only in Hungary but also to to let the German speaking world know about Hungary. So it's it's um, uh, on one hand we are talking about distribution of knowledge within the Kingdom of Hungary, but on the other hand we are talking about distribution of knowledge outside the borders of the Habsburg monarchy or at least the, uh, the German speaking world. So um, uh, the, there's no doubt about the importance of uh, these German speaking uh, persons in, in Hungary and their efforts. And also what, what I would also like to just uh, say briefly, because I left it out from my talk, is that you must not forget that the, the schools in Bratislava, the court, um, 
uh, in, in Bratislava, the whole infrastructure like the printing press and so on were more or less in the hands of German speaking individuals. Uh, I will name a few of them during my, my talk, but this is for me, this is a very important um, uh, asset that all the, the, the intellectual, the means of production and so on, they were in, in the hands of German uh, speaking uh, persons in, in Bratislava. And um, yeah. Well, yes, and I would also like to say then a few words about the the, the um, um, expression uh, that that we had uh, in the previous speech about the Hungarus, but then Hungarus is, and and uh, maybe also we can talk about it why why um, a Palfi or a, or a, or a Esterhazy can never be a Hungarus. This is um, something completely completely different, a completely different identity model. So, as I said, the Kingdom of Hungary, let me start with my speech. The Kingdom of Hungary was a multilingual society. We know this. So this I don't I don't have to to stress this out. It was a multilingual society. In addition to Latin and the colloquial Hungarian, Slovak, etc. language, German initially prevailed as the language of science and scholarship in general, but also of the press in large areas of the kingdom, such as the capital Pressburg, the Spice region, so Tsips, uh, um, upper Hungarian region, uh, in Transylvania, but also in um, cities like Odenburg, Sopron, where I'm at the moment, in Raab, Hungarian Dür, but also Pest and uh, often at that time not united yet. So these were all regions with a very strong German speaking uh, intellectual potential. The first important periodicals of the country, as well as the first newspaper appeared in German, apart from the very short lived Latin Nova Posoniensia of uh, Matthias Beel, in 1821, this was a, a newspaper that's connected to the to the, the um, school, to the grammar school in the Lyceum in uh, Bratislava in Pozhoň. Bill Matyash at that time just returned from from Germany, where he had um, studied in Halle and worked in Halle, and uh, uh, learned all the new methods there at the Frankische Stiftung, where he was working about how to how to integrate magazines newspapers into um, the scholarly uh, work. So he has, uh, uh, he has um, uh, yeah, edited this Nova Posonenza only for a very short time. And we only know from um, other sources than himself that this, uh, that this, uh, oh, now I've lost my <laughs> text. Just a second. Mm -hmm. I think you have you have now. Um, can you hear me? Oh, yes, yes. I lost your presentation. It was a mistake. Uh, okay. Okay. No, but I I have I need my text, which is also here on. Okay. okay I have it now. Okay. So um, it is Matthias Bale, uh, Baleus, or uh, uh, Bale with an accent in the Hungarian speaking world. He um, he brought all these new methods to to Hungary, and he was uh, one of the directors directors of the the uh, Lyceum in Pressburg, and he had a very big impact on all the scholars that um, visited this school and would later on play a very important role in in Pressburg's um, prosperity as far as cult the cultural life is concerned. 60 years before Joseph II's degree regarding the introduction of German as an official language of the entire kingdom in Hungary, Bale wrote about the usefulness of German. This is a Hungarian quote. I will not read it in Hungarian, uh, but I will translate it to you. So what he, sa what he says here is that God has sent us um, uh, kings from the, Austrian, uh, from the Austrian court, the Austrian house, and um, therefore also the, the, the um, scholarly efforts are blossoming. And uh, now we see that uh, this language of our country, so the German language um, is very important. And uh, we, we, had, we know 
for a long period of time, we know that uh, that it's uh, it's a pity that we we don't speak better uh, German. So he was uh, um, he was. Um, uh, uh, convinced that the German language would help the Hungarian language to develop uh, in cultural scholarly respects. According to Bill, a large part of the population of Hungary had mastered the German language, partly because of German origin, but also because many Hungarians had stayed in German speaking foreign countries. Consider the large number of Protestant students, for example, who were forced to study outside the Hungarian borders or had acquired language skills through ongoing reception of German books. Language acquisition within the family, the teaching of another national language besides the mother tongue often took place within the home, often by the household staff. Multilingualism was socially encouraged and counted as an advantage in terms of professional advancement. The population of the country's largest cities was bilingual or even trilingual, according to Bill, with German, Hungarian and Slovak spoken in Bratislava, in Kaschau, Eperjes, and German and Hungarian in Schopron, Oedenburg, Günz, Köseg, and Raab, Gör, and Altenburg, which is Magyarovar, to highlight just a few places. The educated classes wrote, read, and communicated in Latin as well, of course. We are not talking now about the Hungarian nobility, okay? We are talking about the arising uh, um, uh, big population of, of uh, the, the bourgeoisie, the Hungarian bourgeoisie, and the, let's, let's call it the, the, the lesser noble um, um, society here. We are not, not speaking of, of, of the Esterhazes, of course, who spoke all these languages like French and German and so on, because they had their nannies and were visiting schools. So we, uh, um, I wanted to speak about the Latin model and, model and the Hungarian model, but I'm, I'm shortening my, my uh, lecture here now, and I'm speaking only about the German speaking model of that time. So as early, <coughs> sorry, as 1950, <coughs> as in the 1950s, uh, the earlier mentioned Karl Gottlieb Windisch, who was a private scholar, a merchant, and later a local politician from Bratislava dared to make an advance by being, as the sources suggest, at least the co-initiator, if not the founder of a learned society in Bratislava, whose determined concern was the promotion of the German language in the field of science and in cultural life, the so-called Pressburgische Gesellschaft der Freunde der Wissenschaften. So he is here very much in the tradition of, of Matthias Beel, uh, stating that the, the knowledge of German, the command of German is very important if we want to improve. Uh, the members may have come from all walks of life, but the preferred language of lectures and scholarly discourse was to be German. The choice may have been made for two reasons, as I think. First, the society had its seat in Bratislava, Pozhoin, Pressburg, a city whose scholarly world was German or rather multilingual. Let's call it multilingual, but also German. And secondly, the aim of the society was, among other things, the dissemination of knowledge about Hungary, addressing the German speaking foreign countries. It was probably also planned to publish the contributions of this uh, uh, learned society. In addition to this work, to his work as an organizer of the society, Windisch also contributed very early to German language foreign journals, as early as the, 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 the uh, 1760s already. From the existing lecture, uh, list of the society of this um, uh, in, that was founded in Bratislava, it appears that his speciality in these early years was literature, especially literary translation from the Italian language. He translated a lot of Metastasio, for instance. Whether these were his own, own works or, or, or he just claimed them to be his own works, well, this we cannot clearly uh, um, uh, state now anymore. However, his diverse knowledge 
of languages is readily uh, cited in contemporary sources. For example, Gottfried von Rotenstein, a traveler, a travel writer from Pressburg, Bratislava, wrote in a travelogue that appeared in Germany in the uh, 1780s. And I quote, in the in Windisch house, there are some very beautiful paintings and two very beautiful vases of Volterran alabaster. They are incomparably adorned with sublime wine tendrils. The library is numerous and exquisite. Also, the owner of it is a very learned and well-read man who understands five languages and has written many useful books for the country, especially a complete geography of Hungary and Transylvania. From 1764, the private scholar who was extremely active in cultural and scientific matters finally devoted himself to journalism, to newspaper writing, as he puts it. Together with the printer and publisher Michael Landerer, another German speaking uh, person in, in Bratislava, Landerer, you know, the, the, the Landerer family was all over the, the, the Habsburg monarchy. They were, they were having their printing presses in Vienna and in many places of the Hungarian um, empire as well. He published the Pressburger Zeitung from July of the same year, so 64, um, uh, which was to exist until 1929, which is an enormous, enormous time span. The paper was well received right from the start and as it had been launched at the right time. At the same time, the governor couple, Marie Christine, Archduchess of Austria and daughter of Maria Theresia, moved into the newly renovated castle of the Hungarian capital together with her husband, Albrecht of Saxony Teschen. A blossoming life at court could be expected, but also the revival of culture. As expected, the readers also turned up. According to Slovak book research, the paper reached a circulation of 400 copies around 1780, which is a lot, 1780, a figure that doubled after 10 years and rose to 2,500 at the turn of the century, not including the copies that were sold directly in the city of Bratislava. In later years, Windisch additionally edited three supplements which had first recalled the model of the earlier German moralische Wochenschriften, but later were increasingly scientific in content. Finally, in 1781, <coughs> he published his main periodical, which I consider as the most important magazine of, uh, of uh, 18th century Hungary, the Ungrisches Magazin, which lived with interruptions until 1787, and was considered the most important scientific organ in the country. From the very beginning on, he engaged only the most trustworthy experts in his periodical. I name a few, the historian Daniel Cornides from Transylvania, the Transylvanian pastor Johann Seifert, the very famous Jesuit Georg Preugür in, in Hungarian, uh, the medical doctor Zacharias Husti, Samuel Aportis from Zips, Josef Benke from Transylvania, Alexius Horani, also from Pozon, Stefan Schönwiesner, Karl Wagner, Stefan Vespremi, to mention the most active participants. When choosing his companions, Windisch did not take any risk. He knew all of them personally, or at least from previous publications, mainly in the Privilegierte Anzeigen. The Privilegierte Anzeigen was a magazine that appeared in Vienna in the 70th of the century, and it was an entirely Hungarian initiative. So I would, I would even say that the first Hungarian uh, magazine was published in Vienna and not in, not in Bratislava. I consider the Privilegierte Anzeigen as one of the, the, the first very important magazine uh, concerning Hungarian affairs of that time. Some of them had attended the, 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 some of his uh, uh, co-workers, his, his colleagues, had attended the same school as Windisch, the Protestant Lyceum in Bratislava. 
when he um, when he came up with his idea uh, of um, of um, publishing this um, uh, Ungarisches Magazin, he turned to the public with the following request that I'm going to read in German now. Wir ersuchen also alle gelehrte, rechtschaffene Patrioten, wenn sie diesen Vorschlag billigen und ein so nützliches und zur Ehre unserer Nation abzweckendes Vorhaben zu unterstützen, die Gültigkeit haben wollen, ihre Aufsätze, welche ungarisch, lateinisch oder deutsch geschrieben sein können, an den Verleger dieses Magazins, den privilegierten Buchhandler Herrn Anton Löwe zu schicken, da sie dann nach Gefallen mit oder ohne Beisetzung ihres Namens eingerückt und alle darauf verwandten Unkosten vergütet werden. So he writes that he is asking all the, the, the scholars uh, in, in of the Kingdom of Hungary uh, to send their their um, texts, to send their their the results of their of their uh, um, of their um, encounters in uh, Hungarian, German, or Latin. So he accepted all three languages. Of course, they were these um, uh, the Latin texts and Hungarian texts were translated into German then. So the publishing language was German, but uh, everybody could contribute even if they were not of German mother tongue. And he also writes that they are going to pay for for the the text for the for the the articles. Um, in a letter to Daniel Cornides, his, his main cooperator, he even mentioned an exact amount of compens and uh, the printer Anton Löwe was ready to pay for an article. So we have a, a whole enterprise here already. The Ungrisches Magazine had been highly welcomed by numerous individuals of importance as Anton Friedrich Büsching in Germany, Berlin, and Gerhard von Sweden in Vienna. Both of them wrote uh, about uh, the magazine in their publications. It survived for a period of six years, four volumes consisting of 16 pieces. At times, Windisch was complaining about the printer Anton Löwe, who preferred to print school books and religious literature and often postponed the publishing of the Ungrisches Magazine. And as years went by, Windisch had severe problems to receive articles. When two of his most reliable fellows, Josef Seifert and Daniel Cornidis died, Windisch complained to suffer from a lack of motivation himself. Nevertheless, he started a new magazine in the beginning of the 90s, a revival of the old Ungrisches Magazine. Unfortunately, he himself died shortly after the appearance of the first few copies. Windisch newspapers and journals, which were all in German, did not in any way deal with the problem of multilingualism, the possible dominance of one of the national languages in Hungary. His concept did not stop at national borders. He was looking for recognition in the whole German speaking Europe. The pride he took in the positive reviews of his journals from Germany, there is evidence of this in his correspondence, makes it clear that he had reached his target group. In a review of the new edition of Gottsched's grammar intended in the Pressburger Zeitung, Windisch remarks that it would be, would, desire would be desirable and about time that Gottsched for the Hungarian language would finally be found. Windisch did not criticize the Habsburg rulers and their language policy, neither in his periodicals nor in his historical works on the, on the Kingdom of Hungary. In his volume, Kleine Geschichte des Königreichs Ungarn, so small history of the Kingdom of Hungary, which was published and revised several times and which he gave to the historian Daniel Cornides, as well as to the editor of the Wienerisches Diarium, the most important um, newspaper of the Habsburg monarchy, Dominic Barge, he set up a monument to Joseph II, which at least Dominic Barge did not intend to support. I quote, I would have probably liked to see the characterization of the emperor left out at the end. The praise of a living emperor always looks ambiguous. Rather add facts. These are the true undoubted praise of a monarch. It should also be mentioned that Windisch did not comment in his works on the controversial language decree of Joseph II of May 11, 1784. Barge also criticized this omission. 
In contrast, the Hungarian language newspaper in Pressburg, for example, which appeared 1780, did take a stand against the decree. The level of consternation was, of course, completely different. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Seidler, for your fascinating speech. And uh, we are very sorry to hear you, uh, you're ill. And uh, I think we will all wish you a quick recovery. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, does anybody have questions or Mart? Oh, I see. Sorry, I see Julia Wood and uh, yes, and who else? And Dr. Sandor Bene or not? Oh, no, no, only Julia Wood. Yeah, please. Okay. First of all, let me uh, uh, thank you for your brilliant talk. Uh, I've learned so much uh, helpful uh, new information. And I have two questions uh, for you. The first one is, um, did the activities uh, of the German intellectuals, intellectuals you were talking about um, on the dissemination of German language ever face any open opposition or a protest on the part of the local population of the uh, Kingdom of Hungary. And um, the second question is, um, did um, this sort of activities uh, can contribute in some way to the strengthening of the loyalty to the ruling House of Habsburg? among the population of this kingdom. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So first, I think the first question was whether it had an impact on, on, uh, on the Hungarian population. Did I understand you properly? Whether, whether it, it had an impact that there was a German speaking magazine? Was this your first question? I, did, I didn't get it quite well. Uh, so uh, all these uh, um, mag uh, the activities of these magazines, they do not any uh, ever lead to any protest? I don't know. Uh, yeah, I see. I see. Yes, yes. No, no. These magazines, they, uh, how, uh, they, they in some way prohibit the uh, activities, uh, or um, I don't know. They come to the uh, um, to the house of the printing of mm -hmm. the. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, um, no, these magazines didn't lead to any protests of uh, nobody, you know. First of all, um, 18th century uh, magazines, this is a, was a subject, was a, a matter of a, of a rather small group that, that had even, even uh, uh, got hold of these magazines and was maybe influenced by these magazines. So they, they, they didn't have any uh, political impact, if this is what you might imply here, not, not, not the, the slightest political impact. I mean, this, um, the German population of Hungary at that time was 10% of the whole population of the Kingdom of Hungary. Okay, but uh, nevertheless, the command of German was, of course, widespread. So it's not only these ten percent who who would who would understand German, but they, the the magazines didn't have any political impact. And I also am uh, convinced, um, after all my researches, that there was there were also no hard feelings between between those who were publishing in German and those who were from let's say the 1780s on publishing in in. Uh, uh, Hungarian. I, I see a lot of cooperation from the beginning between um, uh, Hungarian speaking and German speaking scholars. Um, I don't think that this has any 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 impact. Uh, I don't think that that uh, Windisch was um, excluding anybody from his from his magazine by uh, the fact that this is not a German speaking or this is not a, as I said, he, he from the very beginning, he stated that um, you can send an, uh, articles in any language. So in this respect, he was he was he himself spoke Hungarian also very well at that time. Uh, children were sent around in the country to other to other parts of the country where they would learn another uh, language. So he was sent to your Rab. Um, to learn Hungarian, he also spoke Hungarian, so he didn't he didn't have problems with this. His main aim was not Hungary. His main aim was uh, the German-speaking European world. 
that's where he wanted to 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 introduce in fact uh, knowledge about hungary and that that was i think his i don't know that that was his main his main aim and uh, on the other hand as i mentioned at the end of my my speech that um uh, Bindish didn't want to get involved into any political discourse so um he was he was a, a good friend with all the authorities and he was an, an, uh, not an admirer, but he was not a critic of, of any uh, politics, neither of Maria Theresia nor of, uh, of Joseph II. He would never have, uh, have written any critics on on uh, on one of the Habsburg monarchs, never, and even the 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 he didn't get involved into the discussions around the 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 German the language edict, not at all. So, so the readers, the auditory of these magazines were uh, abroad. So local local people do not didn't read at no. all. The, no, yes, the locals also read. The locals also read because there were German communities in Upper Hungary, in Transylvania, and in the big cities, and the magazine was distributed in these towns. So it was sent by by coaches by the post. It was sent to these um, uh, towns, and there were there were um, uh, of course readers of this magazine as well. But many of the readers were also in the German speaking uh, European world. But it was distributed in Hungary as well. Yes. I see. So, so you say that you are saying that uh, uh, these magazines did not have any political influence. But uh, can we um, speak about, uh, I don't know, cultural in influence or it was also very limited? No, I think the cultural uh, influence is very high because uh, that uh, you mustn't forget that these were the only the only publications and the only magazines at that time, um, uh, and um, uh, Europe could reach uh, or get information about uh, Hungary through these magazines mainly. I mean, at that time, also the scholarly discourse in Hungary was still in Latin, which was not that much in use in 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 Europe anymore. So, so, uh, and also Vienna, um, the court, and so on. They depended on these magazines. I mean, I wouldn't. If we would go deeper into the subject, I I would not say that they didn't have a political impact. Of course, everything has a political impact that that starts um, uh, a revolution, such as the printing press in the 18th century. But I would say what I want to say is that Windisch had no no intention um, to any political discourse with his magazines. He was he was uh, very um, very convinced about the fact that he is doing only good and he is he's only he was a convinced Hungarus and and he proud of his country. You see, and that's what he wanted to distribute. I see. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you very much. And. Uh... Dr. Bene has a question or a comment. Uh, yes, now I have one, uh, <laughs> but a very short, a uh, very short one. Uh, dear Andrea, uh, only only a simple question. Uh, to put it, um, uh, so you were talking about this language communities, uh, um, uh, which which was uh, which uh, formed around this uh, this newspapers, this magazine. Uh, had uh, had any role uh, in the formation uh, in these language communities and cultural uh, networks uh, had any role in that uh, the religion denomination yeah. uh, maybe maybe a, a, or, or uh, can you see uh, can you see a, a line of time uh, at first in this uh, this extent on, or or another extent? Because, for example, Matthias Bill was uh, was a strong Lutheran and so on. So I think there would have to be some uh, connection. Yes, yes. Thank you for the question. Um, um, I, I I think that. Uh, um, concerning this German-speaking Hungarian press, the religion didn't have any any impact on mm -hmm. on whatsoever. So I was in the, in the beginning of my of my studies. I was also focusing a lot on a conflict between Catholics and Protestants, and and I was trying to find 
traces of conflicts. But as far as the magazines are concerned, I couldn't find any. Windisch and his, um, his, uh, he was, Windisch was working with Catholics. He was working with Jesuits. He was working with Protestants. He was working with Calvinists and Lutherans. He didn't make any distinction. Uh, as it means far that it, it would have to be a common ground, just, was, uh, just, yes. a, just a connection between the religion yes, and the yes, yes, Okay, yes. so thank you very much. <laughs> just start to, start, start to understand it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. And the next question from Dr. Kirill Popov. Yeah. Uh, Mrs. Zaider, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, my question is, if we uh, speak uh, about um, the self-identification of uh, Windish, uh, can we say that uh, he was a uh, uh, hungry patriot uh, with uh, German-speaking uh, hungry patriot uh, with intention to introduce his uh, motherland, uh, Hungary, for uh, his um, for the speakers of German, uh, German speakers of other lands, and uh, to um, uh, and uh, through this uh, to um, uh, uh, to help the uh, the language of Hungary uh, to uh, uh, to progress also. Yes. Yes, definitely. I'm, I'm sure about this. So he was um, he was of a German origin, uh, Vindish of a German background, but he was born in in Hungary already. And um, and uh, he, as, as I said, his intention um, was, first of all, to have uh, um, those scholars who were writing in Latin and who the, the printing press at that time in Hungary was in a very poor condition yet. So there, there was almost no, no print, no um, book editions and so on. So he wanted, first of all, to encourage those people to write uh, for his magazine and and uh, to let the, the world know about about uh, Hungary. Because um, uh, in fact, you must you must uh, know that there was very little known about Hungary at that time, and this magazine was offering historical, geographical, zoological, and so on uh, articles. So it was it was a, um, a wide range of uh, scholarly discourse that this magazine uh, brought to the attention of the readers. First of all. And then the second thing that you said, whether he was also um, also uh, encouraging the Hungarians, um, the Hungarian speaking uh, scholars to publish. Yes, definitely, definitely. He was uh, um, he even uh, stated in his magazine that he would like that the Hungarian would have a, a Gottsched. You know, Gottsched was the one uh, with the German grammar. So he wanted to have somebody to to enhance. Uh, or to, to encourage um, uh, Hungarian scholars to, to write, a, uh, to put down the rules of the Hungarian language in a, in, a, in a grammar book. And so, which happened, by the way, at the end of the century. And also he was um, cooperating with uh, the first Hungarian speaking uh, newspaper in Pozsony in Pressburg, uh, the Magyar Hirmondo very much, a lot. And, um, and uh, he was also um, encouraging and helping Matyas Rath, who was the, 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 the person uh, in charge for this magazine. So um, I think he was a uh, Mindish, from, from my understanding, he was the prototype of a, a so-called Hungarus. For him, for him, uh, there was no difference between between German or Hungarian knowledge. He, he was he just wanted to distribute knowledge, and he was a, a very a very heartfelt. He was a patriot. He was very proud of Hungary, um, and uh, I think he was not alone with with this attitude. I think there were there were at that time uh, many of of um, of uh, of this kind. But he was a very ambitious person, very ambitious and 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 very committed to what he, he, he was doing. Thank you very much for your answer. You're welcome. Thank you very much. And we have uh, another question. Yes, <coughs> Akos Bitter, yes. So 
A very brief uh, question, uh, Andrea. You, you um, mentioned uh, in your speech uh, that um, Pressburg Pozhoin was uh, a capital, so co-capital. We we can uh, say it, and uh, and uh, um, uh, and um, that Löwe um, was. Um, um, uh, Player on the book uh, book, mar book market and and um, do you um, have um, any evidence um, uh, that the people uh, they, uh, they they bought uh, this uh, this newspaper these magazines um, which type of uh, books uh, they bought too and it was the capital and it was the D eight uh, and so. Uh, did it uh, play a role that so many many people from uh, from any part of uh, <clears throat> of, of the country um, uh, um, um, they uh, they they attend um, the um, it, it, it was the capital yes. um, and and um, um, so um, uh, do you you have an, an, an evidence um, um, which other languages uh, they uh, they spoke because maybe you you mentioned the three main languages, but maybe that uh, that in the audience uh, uh, um, were also Romanians, Croatians, uh, and uh, and and so on, um, and 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 the books uh, maybe um, had also uh, um, such. Um, 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 even good. Yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. Um, well, as far as the book market in 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 Pozhon is concerned, this is of course another another <laughs> topic. What I can tell you is uh, from my my uh, research is that um, every magazine of these Hungarian magazines, not every every um, in, in libraries, they have often taken this away, but these uh, magazines were covered in a so called blue coat. Okay, so the cover of a magazine of one one uh, issue was in a blue blue paper and the the uh, back of the magazine was uh, more or less reserved for uh, for advertisements of uh, of the printer so Löwe, Löwe um, would advertise the books he was publishing and he was selling on on the backside of of the hungarian magazine so if you want to to do research in this respect you might find a lot of things there of course Löwe most of all uh, advertised his own books the books he was publishing and this was Horányi and so on. So all, all the, the, the big Hungarian names at that time they were. But, but uh, on the other hand, I would say, as you, you mentioned that this was the capital, but I think that still, if people wanted to buy books, they went to Vienna. And I have evidence for this uh, from the, the, you know, I published the, the correspondence of Karl Gottlieb Windisch and um, with uh, 118 letters. And most of these letters from his uh, friends and colleagues from Transylvania, from, from Upper Hungary and so on, they, they, are, they are full with remarks, please uh, try to get hold of this book, please send me this book, if you should go to Vienna next time, please send me this book and so on. So that was also one of the very interesting and we should also maybe pay attention to this function of, of, uh, of uh, to this role of Windisch that he was uh, <laughs> physically distributing uh, books to, to, to other scholars in, in the kingdom of Hungary. So, um, and, what I can tell you is that um, that uh, you might find uh, evidence on this on this so-called blauer mantle uh, of um, uh, in the, at the back side at the side of the the magazines where you always in the and even what I found very interesting is do you know that they that they uh, they had books on sale. So sometimes when they wouldn't sell a book very good, they would lower the price and, and write that this book is on sale. <laughs> and the second edition comes now, so please buy the first edition for less money. And so it's very interesting. It was a, a pre-capitalistic world, just like ours. 
Okay, thank you very much for the discussion. It was great. And I would propose to continue our, uh, our section. And thank you it much. is, thank you. And it is an honor <coughs> to introduce the second presenter. Uh, it is Dr. Jonathan Sinterton from the University of Innsbruck. And he will talk about the first Habsburg historian of the American Revolution. Please, uh, Dr. Sinterton. Thank you very much. Thank you for the kind introduction. And thank you very much, Olga, for your invitation to take part today. It's a wonderful event, and it's good to see so many colleagues online. And thank you, Andrea, for a very uh, wonderful presentation. I learned a lot from it, and I think it partners very well with my own uh, today. So um, I will share my screen. I've prepared a, a number of slides and I will also read from a script so I can keep to time. Hopefully you can now all see the presentation. Uh, if there are any technical problems, of course, just stop me or, or uh, write in the chat. So uh, the American Revo Revolution represented a monumental moment in world history. From the opening shot fired around the world at the Battle of Lexington and Concord in 1775 to the closing Peace of Paris concluded in 1783, the successful War of American Independence ushered in the dawn of a new era, one marked by struggles predicated on ideas of freedom and intrinsic democratic rights. In this new age of applied enlightenment, the Central European lands of the Habsburg monarchy were not immune from the so-called contagion of liberty which up until now has been largely seen as a phenomenon affecting more or less only Western Europe. Peoples of all kinds responded to the ideas of the American Revolution in the Habsburg lands. Merchants, assiduous to new opportunities, desired to establish new transatlantic trade routes, and editors published thousands of pages of print about the American Revolution in the multilingual presses of the monarchy. And courtiers in Vienna debated the revolution's merits in salons and overwhelmingly supported the American patriots in their cause. Even Maria Theresia herself followed the revolution's course with a deep personal interest, reading letters written exclusively for her by the famous revolutionary Benjamin Franklin. Her son, Joseph II, attempted to meet Franklin for hot chocolate during his visit to Paris in 1777, and later in his correspondence with the Empress Catherine II of Russia, he pitied what he called the poor Americans who in his estimation had fought with bravery and honor. One Habsburg subject roundly agreed with the swell of sympathy for the American cause in the Habsburg lands. And his name was Johann Zinner, who as I will point out later has been referred to by many other cognates, including the Hungarian Zinner Janos. During his own lifetime, Zinner signed himself as Johann Baptist Zinner or Johanne Baptiste Zinner, hinting at his roots as a German speaking Bohemian and a Viennese educated individual. In any case, Zinner was a man of singular determinism and a learned scholar. Both his works on the American Revolution, which up until now have been thought to be lost, as well as his legacy as the first historian of the American Revolution in the Habsburg lands, form the basis of my presentation today. Uh, in three sections, I will first detail his biography and his known biographical details before discussing the numerous works on the American Revolution that he wrote. And finally, I will turn to the idea of his national doctrine by an instrumentalization by several historians. Indeed, Zinner's importance as the first Habsburg historian of the American Revolutionary struggle has made him a target of acquisition, much in the same way that other Central European figures have been contested or claimed by the various successor states, the Habsburg monarchy. In Zinner's case, his long-standing career within 18th century Hungarian institutions has earned him a, a Hungarian identity. Yet, as this paper will demonstrate, Zinner's own affiliations and identity is not so clearly definable. Instead, his semi-biographical and historical writings reveal a man who, is, who represents more than one national identity and who's over belongs to more than one national pantheon. In elucidating his historical works and his legacy, I hope to show the overlapping allegiances of the man himself. And in order to do that, we must first familiarize ourselves with Zinner's biography and his revolutionary works. So Johann Zinner remains a historical figure about whom we know only a few major details. He was born in the Bohemian town of Schlan or Slani, 
uh, sometime in the early 1750s. Zinner came from a literate but relatively minor bourgeois family. He received his highest education in Vienna, most likely under the Jesuits, but it is not known what he studied. Uh, the majority of his life and his early details of his life come to us via his 1782 work, Empfindungen eines Schlanos über die abgeschaffte Leibendigschaften, uh, wherein Zinner defended and supported the abolition of serfdom in his native Bohemia. In fact, he used his origin as something to bolster his expertise on the topic of serfdom and seems to have been something that he was rather interested in. The same can be said for his uh, native tongue, German, which he wrote most of his works and corresponded most of the time uh, throughout his life. This is in addition to academic Latin, which he acquired then through his scholarly and religious studies. Zinner's first appointment was as a prefect at the Royal and Imperial Academy in Buda, where, his first, where he first wrote to Benjamin Franklin in 1778 about his interest in the American Revolution. Evidence also suggests that Zinner openly shared his interest in revolutionary happenings with others at the Academy and in Buda more generally. One nobleman, for example, uh, named Zinner as his inspiration when he wrote his own letter to Franklin around the same time. In 1780, Zinner joined the juridical faculty at the Royal Academy at Kosice, also known as Kassa and Kaschau, as a professor of statistics and history. At that time, Kosice was a provincial metropole where the university had been founded by a local bishop in 1660 as the Universitas Casanovinensis and run by the Jesuits until their dissolution. The Royal Academy at Kosice was one of five new institutions re-established under the Ratio Educationis, the Law of Education of 1777. And Zinner joined a relatively small scholarly community where approximately 17 permanent staff members taught 372 students, all of them male, in the humanities. Based on his surviving manuscripts, it is clear that Zinner shared his American material with his fellow colleagues as well as his pupils. In 1784, Zinner became an ecclesiastical prebend for the Diocese of Spies, meaning that he performed religious duties at the Roman Catholic Cathedral of Kosice, the St. Elizabeth Cathedral, in exchange for a monthly stipend. His extra duties did not distract him from his scholarly output as he completed a number of his works on the American Revolution during this time, but it also reveals his adherence to Catholicism and his lay activities within the Roman Catholic Church. According to the Academy's attendance registers held in the municipal archives in Kosice, Zinner was present, uh, present every year up until 1807, when his name no longer appears, and it is thought that he died around 1810, at the age of 60. The American Revolution was an influential political event in the European mind. It mattered greatly to contemporary uh, Europeans. Ideas of liberty abounded just as fortunes could be won or lost in war. It is important to remember that after the French-American alliance of 1778, the war of American independence effectively became a European conflict, one with increasing intensity as further European powers became involved, particularly Spain in 1779 and the Dutch Republic in 1780. Before then, the land that would become the United States of America had been known only to Europeans as a wilderness populated with Native Americans and developed through the harsh importation of slaves. The Jesuits predominated in the first American impressions of Central Europeans before the debates between French and Italian scholars raged over the idea of natural degeneracy in the Americas. The figure of Benjamin Franklin as an unconventional self-made American genius whose theories on electricity animated and surprised the whole of the European continent marked a rare instance before the American Revolution of American colonists being widely known in Europe. Yet as soon as war broke out between the British North American colonies and Great Britain, Europeans became aware of a host of other major individuals from the 13 colonies, now self-proclaimed independent states. Political leaders such as Samuel Adams and Charles Lee became commonplace characters alongside wartime generals such as the American Horatio Gates and the British General John Burgoyne. Infamous for straddling both the military and political divides, General George Washington arguably became the most well-known American figure for Europeans, second only to Franklin. Although celebrities in their own right, information about their characters and actions in the war came to Europeans by mangled lines of communication primarily through private correspondences designed to spread one side's particular propaganda and through the plethora of newspapers eager to sensationalize battle reports 
or the radical tracts emanating from the, cell, the, the 13 colonies. Zinner, like many, became enraptured by the war of American independence from the descriptions he read in local and regional newspapers, such as the Austrian Wienisches Diarium and the Hungarian Pressburger Zeitung and the International Gazette de Leider. He found that these newspapers often provided contradictory facts, however. Zinner raised this problem in a letter to Franklin written in 1778. The famous American officer, Benedict Arnold, who had changed allegiances from the Americans to the British, Zinner complained with some exaggeration, is, quote, made out sometimes to be a German of Mainz, sometimes an American of Connecticut, sometimes a lapsed, a lapsed Capuchin monk, and sometimes a grocer of Norway. How could Zinner discern the truth about Arnold and many other American and British characters? Zinner's dilemma was all the more urgent, since in 1778 already, he had begun work on two separate books about the American Revolution, and as a good historian, he wished to separate fact from fiction. Zinner was deeply motivated about the American Revolution, as he traveled from Buda to Vienna in the summer of 1778, in order to meet with the first official American envoy to the Hapsa court, who he hoped would be able to provide him with more accurate information. But he missed the American envoy by only a matter of weeks. He turned instead to Franklin, who, wrote, who responded kindly to his request for help. In 1779, Zinner accepted Franklin's invitation to visit him near Paris, where he personally received copies of American letters and literature, and then equipped with the first-hand material, Zinner headed back to Hungary, where far removed from North America, he worked on several manuscripts about the American Revolution. In his letter to Franklin, he noted how he had originally planned two monographs, but in fact, he completed three in rapid succession. It is now these books which I wish to highlight for their historical in, uh, significance, but I also wish to do so by pointing out that three, uh, sorry, two of the following three works by Zinner were thought to be lost by historians. Luckily, during the course of my doctoral work completed a number of years ago, I traveled to Kozice, where I visited the municipal and state archives before locating Zinner's missing works in the Jana Bocatius Library, located in the central street. It is this rediscovery then of Zinner's works and his legacy, which I'm happy to share with you today. Zinner's first book on the American Revolution appeared in print in 1782 entitled Mugwürdige Briefe und Schriften der Böhmsten Generelle in America, Remarkable Letters and Writings of the Most Famous Americans in America, uh, uh, Zinner retold various aspects of the revolutionary struggle up to 1780 through 46 index letters and 13 essays, proclamations and excerpts across 352 pages. Overall, Zinner translated and published either in part or in full over 70 original letters from the leaders of both sides, Americans and British. American patriots, though, were overwhelmingly the focus of this work and received an extensive and accurate um, biography and bibliography. Zinner certainly offered the most detailed accounts of American leaders within the German-speaking world at that time. On the British side, Zinner provided only two short biographies about the G British generals John Burgoyne and Thomas Gage, in his introduction to the work, Zinner outlined the need to show both sides of the conflict in order to present a neutral historical account of the war, um, but most important writings came from the Americans, and this imbalance within his work demonstrates his truer intentions and his partisanship towards the Americans. The text within Zinner's Mercredige Briefe uh, aimed at arousing sympathetic interest towards the American cause. Zinner reproduced Samuel Adams's Radical Address of 1776 from Philadelphia, the same speech that Habsburg censors had banned in 1780, and so it is striking that Zinner dared to republish such material in translation. Zinner's excerpts from the second edition of Thomas Paine's Common Sense also featured justifications for the American cause in a radical way, and Zinner echoed these calls to accept the inevit inevitability of American victory and independence. Merck Rüdiger Briefe was in his first and only published text on the American Revolution, and his other two books were written out by hand and went unpublished. It is these two works which were previously thought to be lost. Zinner completed one of them in 1783, so the following year, titled Notitia Historica di Colonis Americae Septuionalis, Historical Notes on the North American Colonies. And in this account, Zinner divided the course of American history into three distinct periods. The first, from the discovery of America by Columbus to the end of the Seven Years' War in 1763, 
the second from colonial disturbances in the 1760s and 77, to the third, uh, beginning with the French-American alliance of 1778 and ending in the recent Peace of Paris of 1783. What purpose Zinner used his notizia uh, for is, is unclear, but given the title and the fact that he completed it in, in Latin rather than German, it is possible that this formed the basis for his courses in universal history at the Royal Academy. In his 1784, Versuch einer Kriegsgeschichte der Verbündeten Staaten von Nordamerika, an attempt towards a military history of the United States of North America, Zinner distilled everything that he had learned from studying the American Revolution. It was his final work on the American Revolution. It followed a similar pattern to his Notitia by outlining the entirety of American history from Columbus to the contemporary state of the post-war United States. Perhaps because Zinner wrote in his native German rather than Latin, he felt more able to convey his thoughts. The account, accounts of early America, of Columbus's voyages, the war itself are all expanded and dealt with in greater detail, making the Notitia seem like a writing exercise in preparation for this magnum opus. Indeed, the Versuch an der Kriegsgeschichte amounted to a gargantuan 106 chapters, over 535 handwritten pages, all of them completed by Zinner himself, and he even attached his own index at the back of the book, suggesting a hope for publication. Why then did Zinner take such great lengths to write these works? Zinner's motivation to chronicle the American Revolution in some of the most extensive contemporary accounts stemmed from his deep-seated sympathy for the revolutionary cause. He believed in the American Revolution and its importance for world history. In a geographically remote part of the Habsburg monarchy, Kozicha, Zinner uh, composed three monumental works on the revolution, which encompassed all of American history and provided European audiences with some of the most accurate material on its leaders and their revolutionary views. Zinner laid bare his reasons for doing so in the first letter to Franklin in 1778, when he wrote, and you can read with me on the screen on the left here, I was born the subject of a great monarch and under a government whose rule is mild. But I cannot tell you what joy I feel when I hear or read of your progress in America. To speak the truth, I look upon you and all the chiefs of your, your new republic as angels, sent by heaven to guide and comfort the human race. And to give public manifestation of this sentiment, I am composing this work. In 1783, he wrote again to Franklin after the completion of his Miracle de Gabrifa and possibly as he started his other two works. He informed him that he had dedicated the, the published Mercury de Gabrifa uh, to the American Congress. In a personal preface, which went unpublished from the, the final edition and written in Latin, Zinner addressed the congressional members with the following, and this you can read on the right of the screen. If there was ever a time so worthy of admiration, it is surely the time in which the new republic rose when through your efforts and through your diligence, you very excellent men, the flag of freedom was raised and defended with the blood of your citizens. The Senate, meaning the Congress, and the people of America happily built their fortune in only seven years and founded a new and prosperous republic, which is the, your glory in the new world. This is what amazes all peoples, even far away peoples. And this is what moves me the most that I pass on your young origin, your tireless work for freedom, and the memory that I record at, uh, the outstanding public announcement of your fame with writings. Onwards, you most excellent men, your name is an example of my fully devoted vigilance. Follow the counsel of the just and the good, and you will be held by me with the most glorious praise for those who seek renewal. Zinner certainly felt part then of this re American revolution, he felt jubilant by the news of American victory and his intellectual determination to chronicle the rise of the new American Republic reflected the sense of sympathy which he, like many others in the Habsburg lands, publicly demonstrated. In this case, it meant that some of the most vividly detailed works concerning the American Revolution first came from the hand of a bohemian born German speaking professor in the easternmost corner of the Habsburg lands. In this final section today, I wish to discuss then how Zinner and his works have been appropriated by certain scholars seeking to depict Zinner as a wholly Hungarian academic. I include this section as a nod to the workshop's main theme of individuals caught between worldly and national pantheons. When remembered, these historical works of Zinner have often been incorporated into national histories regarding the reception of American influence in Central and Eastern Europe. 
Hungarian scholars such as Istvan Gal, Katalin Halaski, Anna Katona, and Geza Zavodovsky revert to Zinna as Hungarian, preferring to adopt the Janos variant of his name. Gal, interested in the reception of English constitutional thought, wrote of Zinner in the 1970s as, quote, the first Hungarian to report on the English constitution. At another point, Zinner uh, became for Gal a notable, quote, figure in the history of, the, of Hungarian political literature. And he believed that Zinner's 1970, uh, sorry, believed that Zinner's 1782 published work marked, quote, an important chapter in Hungarian political thinking. While there is no denying Zinner's significance and the value of his works, it is unfair to limit his importance solely to a Hungarian sphere. Zinner's contacts stretch far into the German-speaking lands of the Holy Roman Empire, and as we have seen, his writings to Franklin connected into a larger international movement. Yet Zinner's legacy has been predominantly discussed by Hungarian scholars. There are no Slovak writings, for example, about Zinner except for a brief pamphlet published in Slovak and English by the Jano Bukacius Library. In this pamphlet, Zinner is not attributed to any nationality, but instead his career as a transient member of the Hapsburg monarchy is properly acknowledged. The remaining works then on Zinner, all written by Hungarians so far, feature him in the garb of a Hungarian. Kathleen Halaski's fine work on Hungarian perceptions of Franklin, for example, describes Zinner as, quote, another Hungarian who made Franklin's personal acquaintance. And Giza Zavodovsky, who did the most to popularize Zinner among Hungarian readers, acknowledged Zinner's bohemian roots, though he still referred to him as Janos Zinner even in English translations, and called Zinner, and I quote, a Hungarian middle-class intellectual. Such an attribution has stuck firmly then in Anglophone literature. The Hungarian historian George Barani, who fled to the United States for the 1956 revolution, followed Zavodovsky halfway by describing Zinner as a Hungarian-German professor, a hybrid of sorts. Yet Zinner's biography in part denies such utilization since the Bohemian-born Viennese-educated and Hungarian-based professor typifies a life lived among various nationalities and affiliations. His additional professional service among academic communities in, in Buda and Vienna mark him out as a transient figure able to move within and beyond national boundaries. Moreover, Zinner himself showed no signs of adopting the Hungarian language during his lifetime in Kozice, where he taught in Latin and continued to write in German. If there, were any, if there was any nationality then uh, that Zinner lived out his life, it was as a proud German-speaking Bohemian. In his published work on the abolition of serfdom in, in Bohemia, Zinner wrote in the first person, i.e. from the perspective of a Bohemian and referred to the land as his own. Rather than seeing himself as one particular nationality, however, Zinner professed a deep late enlightenment adherence to a global community, which in his view had come into existence through the actions of the American revolutionaries. His world was extensive and borderless. Although he was the subject of a great monarch in his words, he was also actively contributing to the wider Republic of Letters dedicated to the improvement of humanity wherever it may occur, be it in Central Europe or in North America. Yet Zinner's memory has become truncated and curtailed in the current historiography. And the first Habsburg historian of the American Revolution was as much a citizen of the world as he was a member of multiple national pantheons and identities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a great presentation. And now we can open a questions and answer session. And I see the first question from uh, Julia Boot. Yes, please. Uh, thank you very much for an interesting presentation. Uh, my first question, uh, question um, is uh, in regard with your, uh, your last section of your presentation, uh, where you talked about um, uh, the identity of Zina. So mm -hmm. I just uh, wanted to know what do you think about the concept of uh, the so-called layered identity. You know, some of American historians uh, uh, write that uh, the population of Habsburg monarchy in most cases uh, had this layered identity, uh, which combined several identities. So uh, do you think that these concepts can be applied to uh, your character, to Johann Zina? Or you would rather prefer to call him a cosmopolitan, the citizen of the world. Mm -hmm. And um, 
my second question is um, how would you uh, assess uh, Dina as a historian, a professional historian, and his uh, uh, approach to history writing? So uh, was he impartial or he was rather biased? So. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, two very great uh, questions, and uh, I hope I can answer them satisfactorily. Um, so first of all, about the layered identity, I think it's a very nice term indeed, and one that is very applicable in Zinna's case. Um, this again is a person who, as we see with many Habsburg individuals, uh, is born and raised in one particular milieu, travels to another place, and then settles in another place. So in his case, um, he adopted then uh, many different uh, sort of identities or backgrounds. Um, and I think that if we look at the Habsburg monarchy as that composite state of uh, many different uh, ethnicities and, and identities, then Zinna is a typical example of how those can overlap and combine together in that way. I would however point out that, especially in some of his writings, uh, he does lean on his bohemian origin uh, as something as a, a uh, legitimacy for his views. And I also point out that in Zinna's case, it's rather difficult to, um, to fully argue this, given that we don't know all of his biographical details at the moment. But this is something that I would like to uh, continue working on and hopefully to solve, uh, particularly where he studied in Vienna, for example. So I, I agree with you um, with your, your main point of your question. And then the second point about um, his approach as an historian and how he um, operated, let's say, as an historian, uh, whether he was biased or not. Um, I think I have a tremendous amount of respect for him as a scholar, as an historian, and remember he was a professor of statistics, but as well as universal history. Uh, his approach to history at that time was evidently very much based on sources, uh, going to Vienna to try and meet with William Lee, the first American envoy, and then later going to Paris uh, to meet Franklin, uh, is a very um, noble effort, of course, and that is his main uh, sort of preoccupation to collect these sources. First of all, he prepares them as, as a publication in 1782 as the Merkwürdig Briefe, and then he uses them as the basis for then his histories uh, later on. Um, so I think uh, his main historical approach is, is to be based on sources. He is, of course, biased, and he um, doesn't really acknowledge this. So as I pointed out in the introduction to his published work, he says he should show both sides. But as you read that uh, volume, it's rather one-sided, and it is very much in favor of the Americans rather than the British. So he, he is not necessarily a neutral observer in the American sense, um, although he bases his work on uh, sources. So I hope that answers both your questions, and thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Booth. And uh, now, it's, uh, Dr. Theodor Shek Bernardic, please, your questions. Uh, my question, uh, hi, uh, so the presentation was really great. I enjoyed it very much. And uh, my question is actually very similar to Julia's. And the first was, uh, I wanted to know, uh, I, um, I want to find out if, uh, uh, if you, Jonathan, could somehow uh, recognize Zinner um, uh, sources. So uh, what, uh, what about his scholarly practices? How did he get a knowledge about the, the revolution, about those people? You mentioned that he mentioned that he met Benjamin Franklin. He edited these uh, letters of uh, generals of letters. So somebody, he must have had uh, uh, collaborators in this, in this field. And the second question is, uh, and you partly answered it, but uh, uh, do you recognize this cosmopolitan discourse in, in his texts? Uh, because I think those manuscripts, they look, they look like if they, they were copied manuscripts for uh, um, teaching purposes. So uh, it would be great to somehow confirm Franco Venturi's thesis that the Enlightenment was a marriage between patriotism and cosmopolitanism. And uh, so this, this would be a proof that uh, uh, Hungarian Bohemian teacher was actually practicing this uh, enlightenment ideology among his students. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you, you very much. Uh, great questions and a great suggestion there at the end as well. Um, the first point then about Zinner's sources, as I, as I mentioned, uh, he worked very much with source material for his um, books. Um, of course, he, he collected these 
from Paris, uh, from Franklin himself. And whilst we don't have um, Franklin's side of the correspondence, we know that Frank, you know, Franklin offered him this or that or anything like this. We do know that um, they visit him, they met in person, and that Franklin gave him a number of copies of letters. It's not really known what exactly. Um, we can infer some of these from the um, from the published work, from the edition. Um, the others, it seems that they come from newspapers, and it's uh, possible in some cases, at least the ones I've tried, to pick out then the quotations and the excerpts that he cites and to match those with uh, newspapers in uh, Vienna and in Pressburg. So he obviously relied not only just upon the sources uh, that he got personally from Franklin, but ones that he also then um, scoured in the, in the newspapers. Um, but this would require uh, a bit more work to kind of identify all of the sources for this. Um, then the cosmopolitan, oh, sorry, just to finish that point, actually, collaborators is an interesting word and an interesting question. Um, I don't know if he had any other collaborators beyond this. Um, certainly other Hungarians were in favor of his work, um, mainly the Sacheni family and Kaczynski. Uh, they both uh, read this volume, uh, it's published in 1782, and it uh, received a sort of lot of support from, from them, both as readers um, and possibly as collaborators in that sense. And I must say then on that 1782 volume, of course, you might have noticed it was published in Augsburg, which makes sense. Then it was something which contained material banned by Habsburg censors. Um, but very few of these copies are existing today. There's one or two in, in places like Harvard and then in the National Hungarian Library that belong to the Zacheni family. So, you know, understanding its scope and its impact is, is rather difficult. Um, and would probably require more work than on these on these possible collaborators, people who either bought the book or helped for it to be created. And the cosmopolitan discourse is certainly present in these texts, um, especially in the, um, the the later works and the notes, as well as then the the Kriegsgeschichte. Um, both of these texts contain a sort of teleological uh, view. So ones that write the beginning of American history leading up to the Declaration of Independence. So it's a very much positivistic view of American history and, and, and the United uh, States and its creation. Uh, again, my suspicion is that he used these as materials, especially in Tietze. Um, one of those is not written in his hand, and there are in instances and passages that look in a different hand. So this is possibly uh, written with the help of his students or with some sort of university member. Um, the Kriegsgeschichte, again, is written in German, his native language, and it seems to be his script, comparing it to his signatures on other documents. Uh, and this, I suspect, uh, was something that he wrote and hoped to get published, but either couldn't or didn't uh, for whatever reason. So. Um, it's difficult to ascertain uh, essentially how he used these sources or why he he wrote them as such. Um, but yeah, it would it, it would seem likely that they were used for teaching, uh, especially given his profession and his uh, position as a universal historian in uh, in Kozice, of course. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. And I don't see. Raised uh, anymore? Ah, oh, sorry. Yes, um, Andrea Seidler. Yes, thank please. you. Just, just one very short question. Did he? Um, um, maybe I didn't get it. Now, did he speak English at all, or? or? Um, it doesn't seem that he spoke English. Um, it must be that he he read uh, English for some of these letters and excerpts. Mm -hmm. He certainly translated English texts into German. Mm -hmm. um, with Franklin, he corresponded in French. And it's possible that when he met Franklin, he used French. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And more questions, comments? Uh, no, I don't see any more. And um, thank you, Dr. Singleton. And well. um, I'm closing the second section and thank you very much for to everyone for the brilliant discussion and I'm passing the button of moderation to my colleague Ludmila Novoseltsova. Yes, thank you. Bye. Thank you, Lydia. 
Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, really glad to see you today uh, and gives me great pleasure to uh, open the next section of the roundtable uh, that um, have titled Between Oblivion and uh, Remembrance. We are waiting for our second speaker, Ivana Chiric. Uh, she still hasn't connected. And uh, now I uh, introduce as a speaker, Dr. Olga Havanova uh, with uh, her paper, Nationality Courtier, uh, the Forgotten Hungarian Diplomat Count Nikolaus Esterhazy. Please, Olga Vladimirovna. Uh, thank you very much. I am, oops. I am sharing my presentation with you. Yes. Can you see it? Yes. Uh huh. So, my paper is uh, devoted to a character who I have been studying for many years already, and I am working on a monograph about this uh, count, Nicolas Esterhazy, and I would like to share some observations concerning his uh, identities and uh, place in uh, the national pantheons in present paper. Count Nicolas Esterhazy uh, was one of the first Hungarian aristocrats to succeed as a diplomat in the Hungarian monarchy, in, in, in the Habsburg monarchy. And still, he remains an unjustfully forgotten figure in Hungarian and Austrian history. For 20 years, he represented the House of Austria at short and long term embassies in The Hague, London, Lisbon, Warsaw, and Dresden, Madrid, and St. Petersburg. Much of the family archive uh, perished in that century. The complete coincidence of uh, uh, the name of Nicolaus Esterhazy Count and Nicolaus Esterhazy Prince. Um, the second one is uh, the patron of Haydn and is much more uh, famous. Uh, so this uh, total identification uh, led to a mess of these uh, two namesakes and their complete confusion. If you visit, for example, uh, the birthplace of Haydn in the Austrian Rural, you will still see the portrait of the diplomat instead of uh, Nicholas uh, the Magnificent uh, in the exposition. There are no biographical studies about him, apart from chapters in the genealogical surveys. Uh, the paper which I present reflects on what identities Count Nicholas Esterhazy might have, uh, might, might have had, and what the reasons are for the complete oblivion in historiography and collective memory. The Hungarian aristocracy in the middle of the 18th century uh, has traditionally been regarded in historiography, in the old historiography, as domesticated by the Vienna court, devoid of the feelings of uh, nation or language. Nicolaus's father, uh, it's a portrait which was found somewhere in Slovakia. It's not, it's damaged and not restored, but uh, uh, that's the only one which I have found in the internet. So uh, this is the father of uh, Nicolaus Esterhazy, Ferenc or Francis. He made a spectacular career in the state apparatus, in the army and at the court. One of the first councillors of the Hungarian Royal Lieutenancy Council established in 1723. The Royal Equerry in 1731, Field Marshal Lieutenant in 1734, the Master of Treasury in 1736, and um, the Field Marshal in 1751. At the first generation court. Не, а я ее пока не листаю. А у вас нету? Do you see Francis Esterhazy? No. Oops. And now? Okay. 
shall I shall I start it again? Okay, uh, I'm sorry for for possible technical folks. And now. Mm -hmm. I could put it on F5. Uh, Там часть слайда в этих технических картинках. Yes, slide mode. So you do not see it at all? Oh, you see. <laughs> no. I do not understand. Okay, then, then I don't know what shall I do. Well, because I, I perfectly see it and it, it says me that uh, I've launched the uh, demonstration. Okay, then, then I don't know. Uh, maybe I, oops. Hmm. Okay, then without presentation, I wanted to show you some more uh, interesting pictures, but now you are to, 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 to listen to my, uh, just to my, um, to my text. So as the first generation uh, of courtiers, uh, he was flesh and blood Hungarian magnate, firmly incorporated in the political culture of the kingdom. We're talking about the father. And no wonder that Francis Esterhazy was fluent in spoken and written Hungarian. The epistolary archive of the Hungarian Royal Chancellor, uh, Lajos or Louis uh, Botani, includes letters from Francis in Hungarian, in very lively Hungarian, and among others where he humbly but persistently requested to find a position for his elder son, Miklaus. Nikolaus, however, although most likely knew Hungarian, communicated in German and French. And there are reasons in his biography for this language choice. Thanks to his father's position at the court, he was promoted to the rank of Chamberlain at the age of 19 and was then sent with his brother Francis. We heard his name, Francis Esterhaz is the future Hungarian chancellor and uh, Croatian uh, ban. Uh, they were sent to Lunaville, to the uh, Knight Academy, Ritter Academy, and it was an old and renowned school uh, in Lorraine, and the young Hungarians acquired French dialect, the same which uh, the spouse of Maria Theresa, Francis of Lorraine, uh, spoke. Uh, after six months of studying, they made a long voyage through Europe in 1732-1734, visiting Rotterdam and London, Paris, Florence, Rome, Naples. Uh, Hungarian genealogist uh, Laszlo Berini mentioned also that around 1736 or 37, Miklaus joined the army and uh, took part in the Turkish War of 17. 36-39, uh, when um, he established more close relation with uh, Francis of Lorraine, who later um, would play a significant role in the careers of both brothers. The launch of his diplomatic career came in March 1741, when Maria Theresa, who at that time uh, held the uh, nominal, nominal titles of uh, the hereditary queen of Hungary and Bohemia, uh, she gave birth to the long-awaited prince, the heir of the House of Austria, the future Joseph II. Young, capable chamberlains from Prince Francis's inner circle, including Esther Hazy, were chosen for the extraordinary em embassies that were to bring the news to the light courts. The naval trip uh, Nicolaus was sent to brought him from Brussels to The Hague, from The Hague to London, from London to Lisbon. Uh, and in each capital, he spent at least uh, from fortnight to a month, uh, and then uh, triumphantly returned to Vienna via Madrid and Paris. Esther Hazy didn't miss this chance turning diplomacy into destiny. From 1742 to 1747, in the heyday of the war of, um, for the Austrian succession, 
He was the minister in Dresden in Warsaw. He, he did not bother himself with the diplomatic routine, leaving it to the minor staff. He followed the court to the country, uh, countryside residences. He attended balls. He parted with uh, young aristocrats and he courted ladies. Uh, he was looking for a bride with uh, a dowry. Uh, he married the adopted daughter of the Polish prince Teodor Lubomirski. Uh, her mother was an English woman uh, who in her first marriage was married to uh, the princess Tableman of uh, English origin. Some people believed that uh, the girl, Maria Susanna Anna, was the prince's um, illegal child who he later adopted. The marriage didn't bring Esther Hase closer to the elites of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, but rather made the ties of the Lubomirski family uh, closer to Hungary and Vienna. Between 1745 and 1748, Four children, two girls and two boys were born. Countess Esterhazy did not accompany Nikolaus during his diplomatic missions, but managed the family estates and regularly appeared at the court in Vienna. Uh, after Dresden, the appointment to Madrid followed, 1751. It was believed to become a great success. Two courts were to sign an alliance and Nicolas Sesterhazy was to represent Vienna in Madrid. However, in a couple of months after his arrival, a severe stomach disease caused by the quality of local water almost killed him. He handed over the diplomatic function uh, to, the, uh, to, to Count uh, Georg Starnberg, the future ambassador to Paris, and returned to Vienna. Uh, he spent much time in Baden by Wien and in Karlsbad. The new appointment for the, re uh, for the already recovered Esterhazy followed in 1753. Firstly, it should have become London, but this sinecure was passed to the brother of the Imperial Vice Chancellor Rudolf Colorado. As to Esterhazy, he was suggested instead of London to go to St. Petersburg where, as it was officially uh, mentioned in the um, decree, his father-in-law, Prince Lubomirsky, had good connections at the Russian court. He was promised that it would be only three years, but these three years turned into eight due to the Seven Years' War. The diplomatic career was finished only in 1761, <clears throat> when Nikolaus was finally retired and returned to Vienna. After spending 20 years at the foreign courts of Europe, Esther Hazy remained uh, first and foremost, above all, a member of the Viennese court milieu, in which he sought to return after uh, quitting diplomacy. His cosmopolitanism, his national indifference in a way, was mentioned by many contemporaries. Esther Hazy's entourage in Madrid and St. Petersburg included, for example, the Hungarian Croatian Count Josef Keglavich, Josef Keglavich, the future Lord Lieutenant of the uh, Tolna County and a custodian of the Hungarian Holy Crown. Uh, also in St. Petersburg, in Esterhazy's suite, uh, one could, could meet uh, a Hungarian nobleman, an officer uh, in one of the Hungarian regiments, Janusz Kempelen. Maybe some people know his brother who was the inventor of the so-called chess, chess playing machine. One of his servants was French. Uh, the diplomats reports to State Chancellor Kaunitz uh, registered an incident uh, when uh, this Frenchman caused a traffic uh, uh, incident, um, accident uh, in the night of St. Petersburg and opened a random shooting. Uh, the scandal was um, uh, closed, uh, but the Frenchman was uh, sent uh, away from uh, St. Petersburg because nobody was uh, really wounded. Uh, his indifference to the issues of faith, uh, also, which was also famous, uh, coupled with his pragmatic antipathy to other confessions, especially to the uh, confessions which he called um, or presumed to be schismatic. 
On the eve of his departure to Russia, in a letter to his father, he was asking assistance in completing his servant's staff. But he stressed that those people who would accompany him should not be Serbs, in as much as they might turn out to be more loyal to their Orthodox brothers, Russians, than to their master and their king. When he learned that Count Franz Josef Wallenstein, who since 1749 had lived in Russia and even converted to Orthodoxy to marry a daughter of a Russian aristocrat, Esther Hasey uh, reported to Vienna that he would never visit his house in the future anymore. Did Esther Hasey have a Hungarian identity? In a political sense, undoubtedly, yes. First and foremost, he belonged to the Hungarian magnate class uh, by the right of birth. His mother came from the brilliant Palfi family. His sister Maria was married to Count Adam Batyani, a close relative of the chancellor of that time. One of uh, Esterhazy's daughters, Maria Josefa, married to Count Janos Fekata, an army officer and uh, amateur poet uh, who was famous for, the, for his correspondence with Voltaire. Uh, his father was the future vice chancellor and judge royal. Um, uh, or Georg the second daughter of uh, Esterhazy, Anna Maria, became the wife of the offspring of an old uh, noble family, Omade de Varco. Furthermore, 1751, Nicholas Esterhazy, on the eve of his departure to Madrid, was solemnly elected to the position of the custodian of the Hungarian Holy Crown. This was an unprecedented case when the custodian was allowed uh, to leave the country and to stay away from kingdom, and his functions were delegated to his younger brother, um, Francis, the future chancellor. After Esterhazy's diplomatic career was uh, over, he was remunerated with the honorary positions of the Lord Lieutenant of the Sharash County and uh, the position of the Captain of the Hungarian Noble Guard. All this made him part of the Hungarian political elite and in this respect, he uh, remained unquestionably Hungarian. Yet, uh, as a historian who was making uh, research in different archives, I could say that I have found only two uh, documents which are written by Esther Hazi's hand. And these are, uh, there, there are two letters in German to his father from 1753 and uh, some uh, uh, not reports, but notes uh, written in French to uh, counties from St. Petersburg. So these are uh, evidence of um, evidence pieces of uh, his uh, language uh, proficiencies. Regarding the ethnic and cultural picturesqueness of his milieu, there is too little information about the language of communication he used. The Russian historian of Polish origin, Kazimierz Waliszewski, falsely presumed that the Hungarian count spoke no foreign languages. Of course, it's a mistake, but it is often replicated in works which quote uh, Waliszewski. Uh, in St. Petersburg, Esther Hasi obviously used German and French. The French was the language of the court during the reign of uh, Elizabeth, and she often talked to the Austrian ambassador most likely both in French and German on, on their choice. And uh, he attended the balls. Uh, he was invited to play cards with her. Uh, he was also admitted to private audiences when some um, circumstances of the ongoing war with Russia required this uh, immediate contact. Both uh, the great chancellor Bistuja Frumin and his successor, earlier vice chancellor, uh, Mikhail Vorantsov, were fluent in German. So he spoke with them most likely in German because these two aristocrats spent a lot of time at uh, the German courts. Count Ludwig Zinzendorf, uh, who spent some months in St. Petersburg in 1755, uh, once participated in a multilateral unofficial negotiations. Uh, and he noted, uh, he, he, he registered 
Esther Hase and Bistujok were talking German to each other and uh, remarks of the British envoy Williams made in French were then translated uh, to the Russian chancellor uh, into German by Exception Minister uh, Funk. So all possible languages were involved uh, and uh, occasionally used. Uh, to come to some conclusions, uh, the memory of Esterhazy's diplomatic success, his failures uh, and uh, possible mistakes quickly faded after his death. In the Austrian pantheon of prominent statesmen, he was but one of many court aristocrats and for inclusion and, and for the inclusion into the Hungarian pantheon, uh, he did not possess uh, a distinctly Hungarian character to be honored and remembered. His name is much better known in Russian historiography. The outstanding positivist historian Sergei Solovyov in his classical multi-volume history of Russia described, for example, pretty in detail, one of Esterhazy's diplomatic triumphs. The overthrow in 1758 uh, by cunning intrigue uh, of the powerful Chancellor Alexei Bistuja Fryumin. And in this sense, Esterhazy is a part of Russian history, at least as long as historians return uh, to the larger historical narratives uh, of the 19th uh, century. Uh, thank you very much and uh, sorry for uh, the broken uh, PowerPoint presentation. Thank you very much, Olga Vladimirovna, for, uh, for great presentation. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, do you have any questions, comments? Please, Dr. Popov. Thank you very much. Uh, one little question uh, about uh, the European travel of Count Esterhazy after the, his uh, studying in the school for six months. Uh, was it some planned uh, study tool or he simply interrupted his uh, studying and left? What was this? Um, I think it. Well, there were not too many aristocrats who managed such a big um, two-in-one uh, studying at a noble academy and making a big um, cavalier's tour. Uh, so I think it was planned by his parents that half a year is enough to get acquainted with uh, languages, um, sciences, uh, uh, get socialized uh, uh, under the uh, supervision of the uh, professors and uh, uh, masters uh, at the academy. And then a big trip was to make their cultural and intellectual horizons wider. Unfortunately, we do not have uh, any narrative from uh, this trip. Uh, there is only uh, a book uh, which was kept by somebody um, from all this wheat, uh, which uh, includes only the uh, expenditures. So we know how many, uh, how much money do they pay for wine, um, powder, uh, attending operas, uh, but we do not know so far. Uh, historians didn't find, uh, unfortunately, any letter where they describe the emotions after visiting Oxford or uh, the um cathedrals uh, um in uh, Flor in Florence uh, um, etc so i think it was a very clever um program realized by the fathers to make a much much better and uh, uh, promoted uh, start for the careers of uh, of the brothers thank you very much for the answer thank you very much please dr boot your question. Thank you very much for a fascinating um, presentation. And uh, you have mentioned repeatedly that uh, Nikolaus Esterhazy is a forgotten figure in Austrian and Hungarian historical literature. So do you have uh, any guesses why such a significant person or a uh, diplomat ha has been forgotten? And um, the second one is, of course, uh, if uh, there is not not much um, 
historical literature about him. So what are your sources except for this work by Solovyov and uh, the letters you have mentioned and but mentioned and uh, where are they kept? Maybe they're digitalized or archived so about sources. Mm -hmm. I think that oh, the absence of a coherent our archival collection was one of the reasons why he was forgotten. And uh, if you do not have um, any comprehensive uh, collection of sources, how to start it. And uh, I also came across uh, this personality partly accidentally because uh, uh, there are two, uh, teachers and colleagues in uh, my life who uh, independently from one another gave me this uh, advice. It was uh, the Hungarian professor and prominent uh, uh, expert on the 18th century, on the European 18th century, Eva Balash, who told me, um, uh, she called all girls in her surrounding uh, my dear son, uh, because she had this son who she um, really loved and adored. And she said to me, my dear son, you should go to the Hungarian National Archives. There are copies of uh, Esther Hazy's uh, reports uh, from St. Petersburg, not originals, but uh, um, carefully made by his uh, uh, secretaries, private secretaries. And I did it and I uh, looked through and I realized that I do not have enough knowledge to, 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 to deal with it. So I sh shall first get a bit more informed in the uh, field of uh, European diplomacy of the 19th century, uh, of the 18th century. And then uh, uh, our dear colleague uh, with uh, Shandor, uh, uh, who uh, advised me to uh, go to this uh, uh, topic again. And he said that, uh, you know, the story about balls and uh, um, adventures is also interesting. So uh, start uh, uh, doing this uh, in one or another way. And uh, I put the... Um, goal for me, formulated the goal for me to try to reconstruct the biography through uh, sources uh, which are not uh, ego documents, but uh, who, which uh, reflect his activity. And those were um, uh, reports from uh, uh, Esther Hazy from different uh, locations where he worked, of course, his uh, reports, um, his diplomatic correspondence from St. Petersburg uh, involved, uh, in my case, both the originals in Vienna and both uh, uh, the copies and the copies in, 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 in Budapest. And I just realized that uh, through the uh, official reports, many things uh, uh, are evident from his very detailed uh, descriptions of his sickness in Madrid because he describes uh, his uh, uh, suffering uh, in physical details to Marie Theresa and uh, up to different, uh, not often detailed, but then uh, they came uh, as a puzzle altogether, uh, mentionings of uh, his uh, stay in St. Petersburg. And uh, my goal is not to write uh, the history of diplomacy uh, or he, Esther Hazy as a diplomat, but to show how a personality could be um, reconstructed through through the non-eagle documents uh, of the epoch. So I, 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 I hope I'll manage that. Thank you very much. That must be very interesting work to collect these puzzles. Then please wish me to finish uh, the monograph before the end of the year. With all my heart. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, I have a question. Uh, mm -hmm. Is it possible to understand from uh, indirect sources uh, did uh, Nicolas uh, Esterhazy reflected on his identity or no? I, di I didn't find, unfortunately. Uh, the, the only identity he had is really uh, the um, Austrian uh, imper and imperial diplomat and uh, a courtier. So somebody who, whose greatest desire was to, to, to go back to, uh, to Vienna. And uh, I think he was uh, tr trickily use, using his uh, sickness as uh, um, 
as a as a basis for for his uh, earlier retirement. Uh, everybody knew that uh, he got very sick in uh, Madrid, that he ruined his health, and these three years were promised to him as a deal that after three years he receives all the all possible um, honors and dignities in um, uh, in Vienna, and uh, he, he he was uh, he, he, he using it as uh, a pressure to as a as a mean as a means of uh, forcing the Vienna court to, to call him back. Uh, he tells a lot about details of his um, uh, everyday routine, but uh, identity could be only speculatively deduced. Thank you very much. Dear colleagues, any questions, comments, maybe suggestions? Well, <clears throat> so if not, if not, I... we can close uh, this uh, discussion. And uh, even uh, Chirich uh, didn't uh, join us. Uh, I, I hope she's all right. Uh, so thank you so much. And I open the floor for organizers to sum up the uh, our round table. Thank you. Uh, dear colleagues, I'm uh, totally happy despite the um, unfunctioning of my presentation during my um, paper. Uh, the idea which we originally had with Daria to bring together people from uh, different Central European countries and research uh, institutes, uh, it came true. And I hope that the Russian colleagues who joined us today, uh, who are um, studying similar or absolutely different uh, issues of uh, Central and uh, Eastern European uh, history uh, learned a lot. They saw people whose uh, works they probably already had already uh, read or will read after hearing your excellent presentations or comments. Uh, so thank you all for supporting uh, our idea, for being with us. Uh, now you know that uh, uh, in the Institute of uh, Slavic Studies, we make our best to uh, develop this uh, direction of research. Uh, and please be members of our future uh, conferences, roundtables, uh, publish uh, in uh, our yearbook. And uh, please also know that we are at your disposal in case any information, expertise, or help is needed uh, from our side. So, if there are no uh, reactions <laughs> on, on what we have said, uh, then uh, let me thank you for spending three hours and a quarter in uh, the milieu of uh, uh, multiple identities uh, among the um, disputed or undisputed uh, uh, heroes of different pantheons. So thank you very much. Thank and you. See much. you. Thank Goodbye. You. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you.